Hello! <clears throat> what's up, Terry? Good to see you. Hello, what's up, Jesus is Lord? Hi! Didn't know if there was a study in that. Oh, yeah, um, I had to do some stuff. So, it's a little bit later than what I was planning. That's why I actually put up a, uh, uh, TikTok story saying that I was going to go live and then some things came up, so I just took it down before too many people saw it. I think, uh, Jackie saw it, Jules... Somebody else, uh, two other people. Um, but yeah, we're going to be doing it tonight. We're actually going to be going through a couple different books. I know. I, yeah, Jill saw it. Yep. Hello, Barb. Good thing I just got coffee. <laughs> Let's go. What's up, Jonah? How you doing, man? Good to see you. Yeah, we're going to be diving in. We're actually going to be covering, uh, what's up, Jubzy? Hello, Karen. Hi. Respiratory. Hello. I was confused. <laughs> Hi, Sheesh. What's up, Katarina? Are you in your car? You know it. I get to be loud and animated and scream without waking anybody up. So, yes, I am. I'm so happy you're here. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm happy you're here. I, 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 uh, I like, I, I really appreciate you guys showing up. It's funny cause I still think it's still, it's still pretty neat how some people take a nap when we, when they know that we're going to go live. And I'm just like, man, that's really neat. People take a nap in the middle of the day just to come hang out. Hey, thanks Jonah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Hello, Laura. Hi. How are you doing? Yes, I do. Yes. Naps are important. Um, hello from Indiana. Hello, Soul Shine. How are you? Um, it's kind of like a little mixture of rain and snow going on here. Love sitting in mine also. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. A little hard to pre just preach to yourself. <laughs> I can't wait for the Bible study today. All good, man. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting one. I don't think it's going to be too terribly uh, long like the other ones, just because we're going to be going through Philemon, which is very short. Um, but it'll be a good study nonetheless. And then we'll uh, dive over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll start 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> and so it's really, it's really interesting because after Philemon, if, if, if I'm thinking correctly, we will have completed all of the Pauline epistles once we once we conclude Philemon and first and second uh, Corinthians. So then we will move on to uh, another challenge. <laughs> Jules, thank you so much. Thank you. You do not have to do that, but thank you. I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, <clears throat> so we'll just wait a couple more minutes and then we'll go ahead and get on into it. But man, have you guys been seeing, um, Yes, I'm listening and working. Very cool. Inspire Fire. What do you do? What you, you're working right now. What do you do as uh, for Night Shift? Um, if you guys, I don't know if you guys are, you know, hello, Jackie. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Fire. I saw your post. Yeah, no kidding. Right? Isn't that crazy? Me too. You're working, building Facebook ads. Oh, man. So, uh, so you're all kinds of uh, tech savvy. Okay, good for you. I am not. I have a hard time uploading videos to YouTube. So I need all the help I can get. Hello, Savannah. Hi, uh, Barb. Oh, no. No nap. Hope I make it. <laughs> it's okay. It's great. Dude. Um, yeah, Mary Beth. I, uh, it, I, I definitely enjoy doing this. But yeah, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to what's going on. Um, not, you know, obviously the whole... The red heifer thing that is very very fascinating hello Alyssa. and uh you know that's not what actually what i was talking about uh jubesy but the red heifer yes is is definitely something to be mindful of um if you've been here we've been talking about that for over a year just because we mentioned it when we were going through revelation um and that was about a year ago so it's really fascinating seeing all this kind of stuff play out and so I think it's uh it's 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 so incredible. It is absolutely incredible to see this stuff in our lifetime. Do you understand how many people have wanted to see the things that we're seeing unfold? Like this stuff is real. It's not like prophesied about 
you know, 2000 plus years ago. And here we are, um, we're seeing things trending that way very, very quickly. It's absolutely mind blowing. The Jewish culture has always thought that the 10th sacrifice of the red heifer would usher in the Messiah. Unbeknownst to them, the Messiah was already here. And so it's just, it's just really interesting to see the different dynamic. The Jewish people largely in part are still blind because they missed the time of their visitation. <clears throat> so that is uh, very important to understand. And it, 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 here, here we are. We have this one person, I forget, in, um, cor, what's it, what is it, the Koran or something like that? This dude, he's supposed to be, <clears throat> it's a, J a Jewish terminology. I can't remember the top of, off the top of my head because we're going to be going in Philemon, 1 Corinthians. My mind's being pulled all over the place trying to <clears throat> remember everything. So you'll have to bear with me. <laughs> um but this dude, he was supposed to be, he's not allowed to be around anything dead. He, like that was like a qualification and the, they hold, hold these people to a strict kind of qualifications and they're very, very serious about this. And so this guy is going to, if he accepts it, he'll be the person who actually sacrifices the red heifer. And that is unbelievable. So not only do they have the red heifers, but they have a person that fits the qualification uh, to actually do the sacrificing and that's phenomenal. So you see the October 7th attack over on uh, in Israel and the Hamas uh, soldiers and leaders made the comment. It was because of the red heifer. The red heifer is going like they understand this is a this is a spiritual warfare going on. And we're watching the physical side of that spiritual warfare taking place in front of our eyes. So it's something to be aware of. It's so neat and incredible. And everything that's going to happen over in Israel is going to impact us, whether we like it or not. It is going to impact us. You're already seeing movement happening all over the place in America. You're seeing movement going on over in Russia, China. You're seeing Taiwan. You're seeing all of these countries, um, things happening all over the place. But it, it's, it, it's unreal. And what, what I want you guys to understand right now that is very, very important to understand is Russia, when the whole Ukraine war broke out, like in 2022, um, Russia was in Syria. And so you, uh, you guys obviously should know by now that uh, uh, Israel did a precision strike on one of the Iranian uh, generals and took them out. They eliminated them. And so that's right next to where their Iranian embassy is in Syria. And it didn't destroy the Syrian embassy, but it was right across the street. My point here is, is that that was extremely bold. It was nothing new for um, Israel to attack Damascus. I need you guys to understand that. Like Israel has always been attacking Damascus, like taking out their airports and stuff like that. But this attack is unlike anything they've done before in at least in most in the recent uh, history. And it's really fascinating because of because. OK, so when when uh, when the whole Ukraine war. Hello, Amanda. What's up, Amber? Um, when the Ukraine war uh, popped off, Russia withdrew its forces or a lot of its forces from within Syria because Russian forces were within Syria. Like they were, they had a couple outposts there. But what was interesting is that now, now you're seeing Russian forces trickle back into um, Syria and now they're setting up more outposts there. And so there are Russian forces in Syria that are overlooking into Israel. So that's fascinating to me. So here's 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 a thought. This is just a, something to consider. But if Israel makes another strike and they try to take out another Iranian, you know, official or whatever, it's interesting to throw the scenario around if what if one of those strikes accidentally takes out a Russian soldier? What then? What if that happens? Because there's they're they're exchanging fire all times, right? So they can't they can't they don't know who's who all the time. So if they accidentally take accidentally take out somebody that waves a Russian flag, how is that gonna how's that gonna play out? It's going to be this crazy experience, and uh, it's gonna be very very uh, dynamic. I should I, I should say. So um, Ghana, stop lying. Oh man, thanks for being here, man. I will, uh, whenever I stop lying, whenever I stop lying, I, uh, or whenever I start lying, I will make sure to stop lying. <laughs> so it's just interesting trying to consider all of these different scenarios that could 
uh, play out. It's just like, what's, what's it going to be? How is it going to happen? How is this going to unfold? Because we know that we need to get here and we don't know what's in between me and you, but we know that we need to get here. So we can't see, you know, like there could be like a couple trees right here, but, um, we know we got to get from point A to point B. So how is it going to actually happen? Very interesting. So you're, you are the best. Sheesh. <laughs> um, Oh man. So I, uh, I just think it's very interesting that they have Russian forces right now looking into Israel. What are the chances? What are the chances? Iran, Turkey, Russia, Damascus. So something, something to be mindful of all while they have these red heifers all while they have this person who is qualified to do all of this sacrificial stuff for the red heifers, who is of the tribe of Levi. He is an Aaronic priest. He's from the Aaronic line. <laughs> I'm just, like, I, I'm just saying guys, I mean, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't know what the future is going to hold, but, um, I know what the Bible says. So that is, um, man, you know what? Ghana, you are like, you're being very crazy right now. Happy New Year. Uh, I'm just going to assume that this is a bot because he, he's not talking very um, intelligently and saying Happy New Year. Shay, what? Um, yeah. Hello. Hello, Andrea. How, how are you? Okay. It's, uh, it's honestly hard to work and do normal things. If you're paying attention, I, that is very relatable right there. Excuse me, sir. <laughs> Where are the stories that don't, um, I, I, I wasn't sure what time I was going to be able to go live. I actually did have a story and then I took it down because I wasn't sure if I, if what time and I didn't want to make people wonder. So I figured if they can make it just by random chance and cool. And if not, then, okay, we're going to go anyways, back at ya. Wowie. Wow. <laughs> yes. Yes. Hello, Donna. Um, okay. So we, what in the, I don't know. There's some interesting Interesting people in here today. Okay, so um, new here, what religion are you? I am a follower of Jesus. Loretta, what about you? Um, we can go ahead and start diving in. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, Jules and Amber and Leah. Uh, Loretta, you are too. Very cool. Um, so we're going to go ahead and we can go ahead and get started. But I just if you guys didn't see that whole red heifer thing, you know, it's, it's pretty much all over the place now, but if, in case you missed it, there is, I, there's a screenshot of what the uh, temple Institute posted on their Facebook. If you're interested, that's, that's in my TikTok profile. You can go read the entire thing. Very, very fascinating. Ignore the negative. Yes, I will. Um, I'm pretty good at that. So it just kind of, um, rolls right off me. Grateful for this study tonight. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Don't say that yet because we haven't done it. <laughs> hey, JT. Thanks, man. Uh, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Uh, do you talk much in here, JT? I don't feel like you you speak very often, which you should because it's nice to get to, to know people. Good. Keep doing this. I will. Just started watching and, and listening. Can't sleep. Okay, Skinner. Well, you can hang out and I'll probably put you to sleep. No problem. <laughs> oh, well, I will. Okay. I did. I did. Holy. Um, <laughs> interesting name. I did. That's what we were just talking about. Fascinating. Fascinating. Mr. Holy Hand. Hey, George. Thanks, man. Thank you so much. Oh, real quick, Ryan. Yeah. What's up, Amber? The name. I know. I was like, I gotta, <laughs> gotta, I don't know. I don't know what our words to avoid here. I'm sure I probably said all of them by now, but you know, um, sometimes I don't realize it or think about it, but when I'm reading it, then maybe do you girls watch Doug, uh, Douglas talks too? No, I, I don't know what that is. Um, say more. Um, 
Uh, Douglas talks. No, I, I no, I no, they do not. Amber, uh, you'd be interested in seeing who he's related to. He's related. Well, we know that he's from the the line. He's from the tribe of Levi because he has to be because he has to be of the Aaronic priesthood, and Aaron was of that tribe. So, um, seems like that would make the most sense. Where is the red heifer center ceremony? It's unknown yet. I mean, it hasn't actually taken place yet, so that's to be determined. It seems like they're releasing information little by little, and it's just fascinating. We just get to sit back and relax and watch. Um, so very fascinating. Um, I, too, am a follower of Most High Jesus Christ. Good evening, brother in Christ. All right. Well, awesome, Skinny Skinner. Very cool. Uh, what's for tonight? We're going to be getting into Philemon, and then we are going to start uh, First Corinthians. Because I think, if I'm thinking correctly, I think after Philemon, I think First and Second Corinthians will conclude our Pauline studies. <clears throat> um, a questionnaire popped up for me wanting to know if I was happy with our interaction with the host. Oh no! <laughs> Am I being graded? Oh man! Give me a give me give me give me four stars. Wait, unless there's 10 stars. And then if there's 10, then give me give me nine. <laughs> Mount of Olives, maybe? Yeah. Um, they, it has to overlook where the Temple Mount is. Uh, you should check it out. Explains the Trinity, the armor of God, different topics. Cool. I, uh, if you message, message that to me, because I'll probably forget what it is. I um, uh, Chelsea had to message me iBible last night, so I wouldn't forget. So now that I have, now I have that. So uh, 10 stars. I am new. Hello. Hello, Pamela. Thanks for being here. My name's Ryan. Nobody asked me. Yeah, I don't know why it does that. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. I'm doing well, uh, Barry on Onyx. Barry Onyx, how are you doing? Hey, Sephora, good to see you. Little bird. Yeah. Okay. Um, you guys, if you guys are, um, <laughs> yeah, I am blown away that you guys are up. I, I always am curious as to what people are doing and why they are up at two in the morning. I guess it depends on what time. <laughs> I guess it depends on what, what time zone you're in. Um, but we can go ahead and dive into Philemon. Um, if you guys are new here, thanks so much for being here. Uh, my name is Ryan, and we've been going through the Bible uh, book by book, and we go through it verse by verse or expositionally, as some refer to it, which just means verse by verse. And so we, so we try to unpack it and dissect these words and try to understand and get a little bit better understanding of what's actually happening. And so that's the whole point of uh, this the studies that we do. Well, I suppose that the whole point of these studies is to, number one, make sure that you know how to get to heaven. And that's the primary issue. I want you guys to understand that that is the primary issue. And how do you get to heaven is the question. There's only one way, and that is by believing that Jesus is God's son, that he led a sinless life, that he died on the cross for your sins, and that he was buried and then he rose again on the third day. And the Bible says, for whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is the only way to heaven by putting your faith in Christ and Christ alone. For by grace are you saved through faith, and then not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So that is the primary goal for if you do not know that shoot me a message here on tiktok i would love to talk to you and expound a little bit more if you need it and even if you have any questions about anything else maybe something that you're reading about on your own time and you have a question about it i don't know all the answers but i can help if i if i if i have anything i can try to help you out and maybe give you some perspective but we're going to be going through philemon we've already done revelation daniel ruth John, Hebrews, James, Acts, Romans, all, all kinds of books. We've done all kinds of books, and I uploaded those to YouTube. There's a link up in my TikTok profile. If you guys wanted to go follow me over there on uh, YouTube, that would be cool because I don't have any other social media. Um, so if you know I get banned or if they ban TikTok here in the next couple months, then maybe we can still hang out and do these studies. We'll see how what the future holds but um there is a youtube link up there and all those other studies are up there if you're wondering you can go back and watch them and pause or play or if you fall asleep like how um amber falls asleep all the time and jules and barb and all, like everybody falls asleep um if you're you know if you, if you have a trouble sleeping you know and i i can definitely help put you to sleep <laughs> apparently <laughs> i'm totally messing with you um D don't only 144 go to heaven ultimately uh no uh loretta 
those 144,000 mentioned in Revelation chapter 11, those are, or no, Revelation chapter 7, um, those 144,000 are the Jewish people who are left behind during the tribulation. So I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. So I believe the rapture is going to occur. The very next prophetical thing is going to be the rapture is going to happen, which means the church is going to go, it just going to disappear in the moment in a twinkling of an eye. And so after the church goes away, then sometime in the very, very near future, there's going to may, uh, there's going to be seven years tribulation. And during those seven years of tribulation, there's going to be 144,000 Jewish people that get the seal of God on their foreheads, and they're going to be untouchable during all the hell that's going to be poured out on earth. And so it's really fascinating, but you can read about it, but that's in Revelation chapter seven, and you'll see that there are 12,000 from each tribe. So there's 12 tribes. So 12,000 times 12 equals 144,000. So those 144,000 are going to be left on earth while the church is up in heaven. And so that's good to kind of make the distinction there. The church will be up in heaven. The 144,000 will still be on earth running around and evangelizing and telling everybody about the gospel as much as they possibly can. And uh, that's who the 144,000 are. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, yes. Okay. Um, Sonny says, nope. Um, okay. I don't believe that at all. You don't believe what at all? Okay. I had a question for you earlier, but now I'll never remember it. <laughs> hey, I feel judged. Good. I'm just messing. Um, you, I'm not judged. I'm just to totally messing with you guys. All right. See ya, sunnies. Okay, so I can go to heaven? Yeah, I mean, that's the most important thing, Loretta. How to know for sure you can get to heaven. It's not of works. We know that. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's it. It is a free gift, and it's important to really, really understand and know and believe that is what we need to put our faith in, Christ and Christ alone. So um, if you have any, Loretta, if you have any questions, feel free to message me. I would, I would love to talk to you about it if, 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 uh, if you would like to. Uh, but let's go ahead and get on into uh, Philemon. So all of these studies are going to be up on YouTube, like I talked about. And so we are going to cover Philemon tonight. And then we will, you know, that won't take too much time. And then we'll dive over to uh, 1 Corinthians and we'll cover 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So in case you're trying to map out how long you're going to be here, I have no idea. I don't know, but I can tell you at least what we're going to be doing. And then maybe you can kind of gauge how far and how fast we're moving. Um, I don't think it's going to last terribly long because we're it's only two chapters. But every time I say that, it normally lasts a lot longer than what I expected to. And I never mean for that to happen. I was thinking about that earlier today. I was like, man, these are four hours. Do you guys realize that I talk for four hours? <laughs> that That's a long time to be talking. That's a long time. That is so much talking. It's not okay. I need an adult. Um, first time here. I'm all ears, brother. What's up, Joshua? How are you, man? Okay, no regrets. <laughs> What's up, Mark? Okay, so we can go ahead and get on into Philemon. Um, so just a little bit of uh, background story uh, about Philemon, just so you guys can kind of wrap your minds around this. We'll do like a little aerial view. But Philemon is the last prison epistle that we are going to be covering. So there's some prison epistles that we've covered before, uh, 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 Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. So Philemon is going to be the last prison epistle. And what I mean by prison epistle is when we read, um, hello, Aaron, when we read um, the last chapter of Acts, if you guys want to go there, what is that? Um, it kind of tells us in Acts chapter 28, um, Acts chapter 28, verse 30, in Acts chapter 28, verse 30, it says, Then Paul dwelt two years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus with all confidence 
no one forbidding him. So this is where Paul is locked up. It's kind of like a house arrest type of thing. It wasn't like during this time when he was in on house arrest, like I want to like, like picture like, uh, like, like he's in a home. He's not in a dungeon, like how he was when he was writing to Timothy, but Paul was uh, thrown in prison multiple times, but the prison epistles, um, he was inside a home. And this is when he ends up actually writing to Philemon. So that's, uh, this is the last prison epistle that we're going to actually be covering. And so it's good to know the dynamic of what's happening, just like a brief overall kind of picture of the book of Philemon or the epistle to Philemon. Paul, who is the guy that we've been studying for so long now, his name means least. He is the little one. He used to be Saul. He changed everything. He completely repented. When you repent, what you're doing is you are changing your mind on who Jesus is. There are people who um, look at Jesus and they're like, okay, yeah, Jesus exists. I know that like no big deal. Okay. But it's a difference when you change your mind because Paul knew who or Saul knew who Jesus was. He knew it. Like, I mean, how do you live during that time and not know who Jesus was? Saul knew who Jesus was. But then when he had that encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, he repented or repent means to change your mind. So he changed his mind on who he looked at Christ. So he looked at Jesus um, as he was just another guy. And then he changed his mind. And then he was like, you are the son of God. And so that is what we need to be doing. We need to be repenting. We need to come, come to Christ and uh, 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 ask for uh, uh, forgiveness for our sins and give our life to Christ. But that can only be done through faith and who he is. And so Paul, this is the guy who's writing the epistle to Philemon. And so Philemon is another brother in Christ. And so Philemon, so Paul's in prison somewhere and he's writing to uh, Philemon and Philemon receives this letter because Philemon had a slave. That's interesting. Okay. So wait, wait, Philemon had a slave. What are you talking about? Yeah. Slaves. We talked about this. There's slaves, servants, bond servants, bond slaves, whatever your Bible translation means. It's basically in our kind of modern times, you can look at it as employer or employee because that's how their economy actually worked. In the Roman Empire, there was like 100 million, around, around 100 million people within the Roman Empire. And so there were 50 to 60 million slaves or servants out of those 100, uh, 100 million people. So that's, that's crazy. So it was, it was a very, very common thing, but it was just a part of their economy. And so this guy Philemon, who is a brother in Christ, receives a letter from Paul. And the backstory is that there's this one guy named Onesimus. Onesimus was a runaway slave who apparently stole some stuff from Philemon. So Onesimus worked for Philemon, and then Onesimus took some stuff from Philemon and then ran away to, to Rome, which is where Paul was. And so somehow Onesimus and Paul, their, their paths cross. And so while their paths cross, Paul ends up leading Onesimus to the Lord. And so you have Onesimus, who was a pagan, he leaves Philemon. He leaves Philemon as a pagan, and then he comes back to him as a brother. So this is a this is a crazy story, and it's a very very short epistle. But I, I it's interesting to see the dynamics here. So Paul's in prison. Philemon's over here, um, free, and he has a servant or a slave, and he is the guy. The slave is Onesimus. Onesimus runs away. He meets Paul. Paul wins him to the Lord, and then Onesimus comes back to Philemon. Now, if that doesn't show a change of heart, then I don't know what else does, because there ain't no way a, a, a servant or slave would run away and do what he did and then come back to the master unless there was a change that actually occurred within that person. And so Paul is going to be writing this letter to Philemon on Onesimus's uh, behalf. And so he is essentially interceding for Onesimus. Um, but it's really, it's really interesting if you, um, so, well, I guess we'll get there uh, when we, when, when we'll cover that when we get there. And so there's a couple different things there. Like if, if um, uh, considering slaves or servants, 
a master could free his slave or a slave could buy his freedom for a large sum. Like if, if, a, if a slave or servant ended up saving up a lot of money, he could end up buying his freedom. So if you guys want to go to Acts chapter 22, Acts chapter 22, verse 28, in Acts chapter 22, verse 28, um, Acts chapter 22, verse 28, it says, the commander, the commander answered, with a large sum, I obtained this citizens, citizenship. And Paul said, but I was born a citizen. And so they were talking about being a Roman citizenship. And so this, it's, it's implied here that this commander was once upon a time, he paid for his freedom in some kind of fashion, or he bought his Roman citizenship. And so it's just an interesting dynamic that was going on there. But a master could free his slave or his servant, or he could buy his freedom. And so there's going to be a lot of different um, pictures that are painted throughout this epistle. And it's, it's really quite neat. And you're going to, you'll be able to connect the dots real simply. It's a, it's a very simple epistle. Um, okay. So it's, 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 so it's, it's also kind of funny too, because um, when we start reading this, I want you to, um, I want you to imagine that you are Philemon. Okay, so you are Philemon for this story. That's that's where I want you to be there mentally. You are Philemon. You are the master of your house. You are a free man. You are a Christian. Okay, so you're a master of your house. You're a free man and you are a Christian and you own sl uh, servants or slaves. They, they, you have servants and slaves that work for you. So with all that in mind, we'll, we'll keep that in mind as we progress throughout this epistle, because I want you to be sensitive to the fact on how Philemon was probably feeling. Because Paul is going to be writing you a letter. If you're Philemon, he's going to be writing you a letter and you're going to read it. Okay, so let's go to... Um, Let's go to the Philemon. There's only one chapter. So Philemon verse one. <laughs> and, and again, throughout this entire epistle, I want you to be Philemon. I think it'll be the, be the most beneficial if you view this from Philemon's point of view. Okay, so Philemon verse one, it says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother. Okay, so again, Paul, his name is Paul. His name means little one or least. So Paul, the least, and he refers to himself a prisoner of Christ Jesus. <laughs> so he's referring to himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. This is interesting. And again, I like just be mindful. You are Philemon and you're dealing with this letter and you know what it's going to be talking about already because we just talked about it. But it's clearly going to be about this person who was a runaway slave. And so now you have Paul, the dude, like if you're Philemon, you're down here, you're looking up at Paul, like he's like the elder, right? Like he's the adult in the room and he's writing to you. And he says, and he starts out his letter by saying, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. You can already hear some of the, like how he's going to be directing this letter because he's already connecting who he is with Onesimus. He's relating to Onesimus. He's like, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Onesimus is a slave or servant of you. There's that connection there. He's he's drawing a line between, or he's connecting to him himself and Onesimus. So he's right off right in the first verse. He's soliciting Philemon's sympathy by referring himself as a prisoner because he's contract uh, contrast contrasting himself with Onesimus. So in verse one it says, "Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother." Now, brother is going to be, um, um, it in verse, uh, if you go over to verse 16, well, I guess, I guess we, uh, so, okay. So he, in verse one, where it says, Timothy, our brother, he says, Timothy, our brother, because Timothy, Timothy is a brother in Christ. Now, why is that important? Because a, the theme throughout this epistle is Paul is going to be drawing connections to brothers in Christ. It's brothers in Christ. It's like, hey, um, Onesimus was a pagan. Then he came to Christ. He is now a brother. He once upon a time was a pagan, but now he's a brother. And so he starts it off. He comes out the door swinging when you look at just verse one, because he's already connecting himself to Onesimus. Um, Onesimus. But now he's saying Timothy, and he refers to Timothy as our brother. So he's already laying the foundation for Philemon 
to make his own connect or conclusions as to how he should look at uh, Onesimus. Hopefully that makes sense. I don't know. If, um, so in verse one, it says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. Um, so uh, in verse two, it says to the beloved Aphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier and to the church in your house. So in verse two, this is his whole introduction for this epistle. He is telling everybody who this letter is to. So in verse one, he's saying to Philemon. And then in verse two, he's saying to Aphia, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church. So this letter is to Philemon first, and then Aphia, Archippus, and the church, which is in their house. And so people don't really understand or don't really know for sure uh, who Aphia or Archippus is, but it's believed that Aphia and Archippus is, Aphia is his wife, Philemon's wife, and Archippus uh, is probably his son. So that's kind of like where most people land on as far as who these two individuals are. But um, I want to rewind and go back to verse one, because it says to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. That again, these words that Paul is using he, he, these are this is wordplay. He is getting Philemon, and he is he's working Philemon to come to his own conclusion. And by the time we're done with this epistle, you'll be able to see everything, and it's very fascinating. It's rather quite amusing to me, at least, how he operates here. But it says in verse two, to beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Now, in your house. Now, it's interesting that Paul. Uh, he, he addresses this letter to Philemon, Aphia, Archippus, and the church within his house. Now, okay, so remember, obviously, the churches are within the homes. This is nothing new. We've talked about this plenty of times. But what I want you to think about here is if Paul did not add the church in your house, and he had just addressed it to Philemon and his wife and son, if he just addressed it to those three, but he left out all the other people, the church that was within his house, I want you to imagine how if you were in that congregation within that small group in that church or in that house, let's say you come over to Philemon's house to have a Bible study. And then all of a sudden you see that runaway slave enter into the home and he's all back all of a sudden. You have no idea what's going on. So now I just find it interesting that Paul had the foresight to be like to add in the church because it's obviously this letter is addressed and it was meant for Philemon, but it was meant for Philemon and you and I. And that's going to be evident when we get to the end of this epistle as well. But it starts off by um, saying the church in your house. So it's uh, it, it's you got the four uh, you got the four people. You got Philemon, Aphia, Archippus and the church in your house. So there's, there's that whole group there. And then it goes to verse three. Philemon, verse three says grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, this is a very Pauline type structure. This is grace. You need to first, you first need to have grace before you can have peace. It's never peace and grace. It is always grace and peace. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace, there's that acronym for you. But, but then you get to verse four. So in Philemon verse four, it says, I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers. Okay, so here in verse four, um, there's a couple things, but the first thing is he says, I thank my God. Now this is again, a very Pauline type of style. He is always thanking and praying, thanking and praying those two things. I hope you guys are mindful of that. And I hope you see how important this was to Paul. And if it's important to Paul, then it needs to be important to you. Pray, pray, pray for Israel, pray for your parents, pray for your pastor, pray for your kids, pray for your nation, pray for your leaders, pray for your congressmen, pray for your governors, pray for your mayors, pray for your school district, pray for all of these people, and then keep on praying when you're done with that. Keep on going. But that's what he's doing. He says, I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers. Now, here's what's interesting about verse four, though, because he says, because he says making mention of you. Now, you can be plural or it can be singular. So if I say I am thankful for you and I point to the chat, there's 150 people in here, right? So that could be, that would be plural. Hey, thank you, Mog. Um, that would be plural. So I could say I'm thankful for you, but that's an interesting dynamic because then I could just say, Hey, what's up, Chelsea? I'm thankful for you. 
And so there's the singularity. So you have a plurality or singularity, but here in verse four, it's a singularity. So it says, I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers. Now, why is this interesting? Why is this important? Um, it, it just, it's just kind of fun to pay attention to the details because if you guys want to go down to verse 25, in verse 25, Philemon, verse 25, it says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Again, the same principle applies. If I say, hey, I am thankful for your spirit, and I'm just talking to Mark here, I'm like, hey, Mark, I'm thankful for your spirit. Like, that's a singular type of usage for the word your but if I say to the chat here, I'm like, hey, guys, I'm thankful for your spirit. That's plural. So what I want you to be mindful of in verse four, where he says, making mention of you, he's talking to Philemon. But in verse 25, it says the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. That's plural. So it starts off in verse four, singular. In verse five, he ends it plural. So obviously, so it starts off, it's a letter. It's a personal letter to Philemon, but the letter is for the church. So he's writing to Philemon. It's a very personal letter, but it's to the church. So that is so that's just uh, something to be mindful of. So in verse four, he says, I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith, which you have toward the Lord Jesus and towards all the saints. Okay. <laughs> so in verse five, it says hearing of your love. Like how is Paul in prison? How is he hearing of his love? Now, this is possibly... Um, because of you guys, you guys remember Epaphras from Colossians chapter one. If you guys want to go back to Colossians chapter one, we've talked about Epaphras a handful of times, but, um, in Colossians chapter one, verse seven, um, you see Epaphras here in Colossians chapter one, verse seven, it says, as you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the spirit. So Epaphras was running all over the place and he was going to and fro and he was just doing whatever he needed to be, whatever work needed to be done. Um, but Epaphras, if you guys want to go to Colossians chapter four, verse 12, if you remember in Colossians chapter four, verse 12, Epaphras was known for praying fervently. And that is so neat because in Colossians chapter four, verse 12, it says Epaphras, who is one of you, a bond servant of Christ, greets you always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So it's, 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 it's we don't know much about Epaphras, but what you do know is that he had such a heart. His heart was on prayer, praying fervently. And that's not Epaphras telling you that. That's not somebody, that, that, that is Paul saying that. And so do you know, like, it's so interesting thinking about how much more something means when somebody else says something about you, right? Like, hey, I can say, hey, I really enjoy, like, I, I, I'm, like, let's say I'm pretty good at basketball. It, like, I can tell you I'm, like, pretty good at basketball or pretty good at golf or volleyball or whatever sport. I can tell you that I'm pretty good at it. But if you play with me, you'd be like, no, he's amazing. He is the best player ever. So you, those kind of words would weigh more heavily on somebody else if they hear it from somebody other than myself, because then it's, it's, it's just not me talking about giving a report on myself. It's somebody else giving a report on me, but on my behalf. And so just so you know, I'm not good at any of those sports. Um, I'm very mediocre, <laughs> but um, I do enjoy playing. Anyways, it's just interesting that Paul knows Epaphras and he knows Epaphras, Epaphras's heart. And what he knows about Epaphras is that he is laboring fervently in prayer. And I'm, I love that. I love that. Be, be in prayer guys. Like it is so important. And that is something that I'm learning more, the more I dive into the, the word myself. Okay. Going back to Philemon and Philemon verse five, it says hearing of your love, which love there, love is agape. So hearing of your agape, it's not phileo, it is agape hearing of your love and faith, which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. Okay, so hopefully you can start um, putting some of these, you know, con connecting some of these dots. Um, because if you remember the background, Onesimus was a runaway slave. He takes some stuff from Philemon, who was, he, Philemon was the master. Onesimus took some stuff from him and then ran away. 
And so he runs away. He goes to Paul. He somehow stumbles upon Paul. And then Paul wins him for the Lord. So he leaves uh, Philemon as a pagan. He goes to Paul. He becomes a Christian. And then Paul sends him back to Philemon. And so what's interesting about that is that now Onesimus is coming back to Philemon as a Christian, as a brother. And so Philemon is a, a, a Christian and Onesimus is now a Christian. And why am I making light? Of, why am why am I talking about this? Because in verse five, I want you to pay attention to how funny Paul is. Paul is he is building his argument. It's kind of like you know how you butter somebody up and you like talk about how wonderful they are before you ask them the tough question or you tell them the hard news. You're like you're so wonderful and I just love how everything. You're just so cool. Do you mind if I borrow your car? You know, like that's type of what that's what he's doing here. Okay, verse five, it says, hearing of your love and faith, which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, all the saints now is referring to Onesimus. So what he just said here in verse five is that, hey, hey, Philemon, I have heard of your agape, your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and towards all the saints. He's just like, hey, you know, Onesimus is one of those people now. It's just so funny. Then he goes to verse six. He says that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. <laughs> So he's laying it on thick, and it's just so funny because in verse one he he uses the word brother, referring to Timothy, being like he's trying to get the whole family mindset around. He's like, hey, let's we're all family here, and it's it, it, so he's like Timothy, our brother, and then he goes to verse seven and it says, uh, hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. You remember how we're all a family, right, brother? You know that's right, sister. I am telling you, we are all in the same family, right, brother? And so Paul is just, just laying it on thick. It is so funny. So he is really tugging on the heartstrings of Philemon here. So this is, so Paul is just, just like lathering all, him all up right now. And uh, just imagine being Philemon because you, you're Philemon. I told you guys, imagine you're Philemon. You're in your home, which is where the church is. And then, you know, like, let's imagine that there's like 10 to 15 people in, in, in inside that home church. And the, the letter is addressed to Philemon, Aphia, Archippus, and to all the church within his home. So he's reading it. It's to him. It's to you but you're reading it to everybody. And so you're the master of the house. You're, you're Philemon. You're reading it. And you're just like, Oh man, <laughs> like what, what? And so, so just keep, keep that perspective. Okay. So then we get to verse eight. It says in verse eight, therefore, therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Okay, here in verse 8, he's saying, what he's saying here, he's like, I could command you to do something here. I could command somebody, I could command you to do this, what is right. But he's like, I'm not going to do that. Instead of me commanding you as like, you know, the, the elder, I'm not going to do that. But what I am going to do in verse 9, he says, yeah, for love's sake, I rather appeal to you. So he's not commanding, he's appealing. And the reason why he's not commanding is because this shouldn't be a command. This is so there's a lot of things that people kind of like to there's like some Im implications or people like it, it seems like this type of epistle people uh, say that this epistle up implies that Philemon eventually did these things and I'll, we'll get to that. But um it's just interesting how he's not commanding. He is appealing. So um, as we continue on, um, it says in verse nine, it says, yet for love's sake, I'd rather appeal to you being such a one as Paul, the aged. Now, Paul is probably about 60 years old. People uh, uh, gauge he's around 60 years old when at the time when he wrote this epistle. But he says the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. 
So again, he's re bringing, he's bringing that back into play. He's, he's really, he's laid it on thick. Um, but then he goes to verse 10 and in verse 10, he says, I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains. So this is why we believe Paul led him to the Lord. And so Paul is essentially Onesimus's spiritual father. So Paul, he's locked up. He's in house arrest. Somehow uh, Onesimus made his way and just ran into Paul. And you know by now, if you run into Paul, you're going to get witness to. And sure enough, he gave him the gospel and Onesimus, Onesimus completely changed. It's just like crazy. I'm just like, I don't know if you have anybody in like that in your life to where if you're like, oh, I'm not surprised at all that you got witnessed by, you know, Amber or by, you know, Leah or anybody like if, if anybody in here, like, do you guys know anybody who like, you would not be surprised at all if you like your friend came over to your house and they told you that they got witnessed to by somebody that, you know, because there are certain people to where, you know, that if somebody's around that guy over there or that girl over there, for a long enough time, they're going to get witness to. Um, so that's 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 what's happening with with Paul because it says in verse ten, I appeal to you for my son. Paul refers to Onesimus as his son. No, they just met not too long ago, and now he's referring to him as his son. That's strange. So there was a there's a very uh, there was an intimate like that relationship there. They became close, and Onesimus was like starting to minister to Paul himself, and we'll we'll, we'll get to that here. But it says, I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chain. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse... Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse uh, 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, it says, For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers for in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Paul, you know, it's interesting because here Paul is talking about all the people that he has led to the Lord. He's, he's like, I begotten you through the gospel. He's like, so we have, like, if you've ever led somebody to the Lord, like you're kind of that person's you know, like, like I mean, that's what Paul was saying, right? Like, he's like, he's like, this is my son. He's like, if I've led you to the Lord, you would be my son. You would be my daughter in Christ. Like, that's kind of what he's saying. He's like, these people, these are family. He's like, we need to start looking at them as family and treating them as family. And so that's what Paul is essentially getting here. So he won Onesimus for the Lord. So going back to verse 10, Philemon verse 10, it says, I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. So it's funny here because, again, you, you're probably picking up on all the different type of wordplay that Paul is using. He is he is a master at his craft. It's so funny to me when I'm reading this because because in verse 11, unprofitable is um, unprofitable is what they refer to Onesimus. But Onesimus, his name literally means profitable. So Onesimus in the Greek means profitable. And so here in verse 11, it's so funny because Paul is like, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to me. It's just, it's just like, come on, Paul. Like, you can't tell me he didn't have a sense of humor. This guy, too funny. So he's using Onesimus's name but in a roundabout way to get his point across. And it's just too funny. But he says, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and me. And so what's also very interesting about this entire thing is that Philemon, <laughs> I mean, Philemon, the name, Philemon's name means affectionate. So, okay. So imagine you're Philemon again. You have been Philemon this entire story. You, your name means affectionate. 
And then you're you're like, hey, my my servant or slave ran away. And then he comes back and you get a letter from Paul and you're reading about it. Everybody knows that your name means affectionate. And then Paul's landed on thick talking about brothers and family and all this and that. And then he's talking about Onesimus and unprofitable and profitable. And you're just like, oh, man. And then you're reading it in front of the church. And so now you got these eyes all looking at you like, what are you going to do? Because you got. Um, like you got to make a decision. You're the master. You're the guy like leading the charge here in this little home community type situation that they got going on. And so it's just so funny how he is just, just, uh, just given it to Philemon. <laughs> I mean, and, and so the question on the table is imagine like the different dynamics here, because Philemon is a master and uh, Onesimus was a servant. And so you need to handle this situation rather delicately because if you, like, and I'm, I'm just wondering what you would do. Would you, would you discipline the servant harshly because of all the other people in your community? Because everybody's watching you, right? Like, I mean, word gets around fast. And so if everybody knows that your servant came back to you, now they're going to be like, well, what you do to him? Because they shouldn't have done it. Because back then it was legal if a, ser- if a, if a servant or, you know, servant, slave, whatever you want to refer to it as, ran away. It was legal for the masters to... Um, you know, that was uh, that was death penalty. And so that didn't happen too much because it obviously servants cost around 500 denarii. And um, so one one denarii was like a whole wage, a uh, whole day's wage for the common laborer. So a common servant was worth about 500 denarii. But one that was like educated or skilled in a craft was worth up to 500,000 denarii. I mean, it was just like, depending on how much money you had, you could buy somebody who was, you know, that's why we look at Luke, like the guy who wrote the gospel of Luke or um, in the book of Acts, that that Luke, um, he is viewed as a servant or slave as well. There is all kinds of people who was viewed as servants or slaves, even though Luke was a physician. That's crazy. So of a doctor, he was a doctor. He was highly skilled physician. It's just very interesting. So anyways, uh, let's move on to Philemon. In Philemon verse 12, in Philemon verse 12, it says, I am sending him back. So Paul is saying, I am sending him back. You therefore receive him. That is my own heart. So what he's saying here in this verse is that tree, you got to treat him as if he is Paul's own flesh and blood. Ha. I'd be like, ah, you're going through a tunnel. I can't hear you. Click. But you can't do that because this is written on uh, parchment. So it's, it, it's, it, you can't, you know, now I can't blame it. I never got that text, Paul. What are you talking about, man? I changed my number. New, fo- new, new number. Who dis? Um, but in Philemon verse 13, in Philemon, sheesh, in Philemon verse 13, it says, whom I wished to keep with me that on your behalf, he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. Now here in verse 13, where it says, whom I wish to keep with me that on your behalf. So Paul wanted him to stay with him. It was just not right because Onesimus, he knew where Onesimus belonged. So Paul wanted Onesimus to stay, but he sent him back. And so in verse 13 here, it says, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf, he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. So it's interesting that he says on Philemon's behalf, he might minister to me in chains. Now, as we continue reading, we're going to see that Philemon must have owed Paul a great debt. And I don't really know what it means, but it's just interesting that there was a there was a dynamic within that relationship to where um, um, Philemon, Paul helped out Philemon in some type of way. So it, it, it I guess that that's uh, that's a couple of verses down. So we'll we'll talk about that when we get there. Okay, so Philemon fourteen, in Philemon verse fourteen, it says uh, uh, it says, but without your consent, I wanted to do nothing that your good deed might not be compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. So he's so he doesn't want he doesn't he, he's going back to what he was talking about before. He doesn't want to command Philemon to do something in regards to Onesimus. He wants it to be a voluntary action. So that's kind of what he's reiterating here in verse 14. But what's interesting, just the whole the whole dynamic, the whole situation that we're talking about here, Onesimus still owed a debt. He still owed a debt to the law and to his master because he broke the law 
and he, uh, he, 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 he did his master wrong. So he broke the law and he did something wrong to his master, but spiritually he was in good standing with God. Now that's interesting because there's a lot of people in the world who do a lot of bad things, who go to prison, for example. Like in our, in our 2024, people in prison did a lot of bad stuff. Now they need to still answer for those things that they did according to, you know, the law of the land and, you know, the, the court systems and whatnot. So, but according to men, they can be condemned to a certain extent, right? And it's interesting to see that those people, not all of them, but some of them come to Christ. And so in so you have, you're, you're standing before men here and you're condemned, but you're standing before Christ here and you're standing up, like up, up straight. And so that's kind of like the dynamic that's going on between Onesimus because he did, he broke the law. He did what he, he wronged his master and he should be condemned. But in Christ, he is a new creation. And it's just an, it's just an interesting, you have like, there's a, there's a duality going on behind the scenes here uh, between physical and spiritual. But it's also it's also it's also interesting on that note, because um, there's a new there's a new he's a new creation. Right. And so since he just became a Christian, his race, you know, the race that we always talk about, his race just begun. And so you have this newborn baby Christian who does, who didn't know better. He was a pagan when he left Philemon. He runs away. He runs into Paul. And if you run into Paul, you're going to get witness to. And then he got witness to and he accepted Christ. And so he's born again. And so you have this servant who doesn't know anything. And Paul was just trying to give him as much as he possibly could within that short amount of time. And then he sends him on back. And then he goes back to Philemon. And now can you just imagine being Philemon, like opening the door, realizing everything, looking at this servant and being like, you are a spiritually immature Christian and I got to help you out because that's what we're called to do. you just got this whole, you're like, ah, and so that's, that's kind of like what's, that's kind of what's happening here. So in verse 15, Philemon verse 15, it says, for perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose that you might receive him forever. So, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's a reason for everything, right? Like what's going on? There's a reason for this. There's a reason for this. Hey, if you lost your job or if you didn't get that job, maybe it's because there's going to be something that opens up down the road for you to have an opportunity to witness to people down the road. Right. And so that's kind of the idea of what's going on here. But in verse 15, it says for behalf, for perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose that you might receive him forever. Forever is an interesting word that he uses there because you might receive him forever. So he, he, so Onesimus runs away as a pagan and then he comes back as a brother. So he, he quite literally is going to have Onesimus forever as a brother because <laughs> we're like, I'm t- it's just so funny. Like Paul is like, you know what, man, like this worked out for the better. Like he's like, yeah, he ran away from you and he's painting Philemon a picture. He's like, Hey, yeah. All things work together for good. And you know what I'm saying, man? You remember the whole Romans epistle that we talked about earlier? Like, that is what he's doing. Romans 8. Like, all. And so he's laying it on so thick here. So it's in verse 15 where it says, For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever as a brother in Christ. Um it's kind of, you know, it kind of reminds me of uh, Joseph, like the things that you, you know, you intended for evil, but God intended for good, you know, in Genesis, it talks about that, but, you know, same concept in a roundabout way, you know, if, if you decide to look at it in that kind of light, but it's fascinating. So in verse 16, Philemon, verse six, verse 16, Philemon 16, it says no longer as a slave, but much more than a slave, a beloved brother especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So again, he drops the phrase, the the word brother. So rewinding a little bit in verse one, he says, Timothy, our brother. And then he goes down to verse seven and he says, hey, Philemon, you've been doing such a great job, brother. And then he goes to verse 16. Um, And he says, a beloved brother. 
So he's really dropping this strong language, getting the whole family thing talking. And he says, just so you guys remember, he's like, I don't want to command you. I want to appeal to you. And so this is Paul's way of appealing to Philemon. Um, okay, so let us go to verse... Um, uh, okay, so okay, so in verse 16, it says, No longer as a slave, but much... But, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? So let's go to Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, it says, Colossians 3, 11, it says, Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcision, or, nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So he is now a part of that family, Onesimus. We're going to see him when we get home, and <laughs> we're going to go. We're going to walk up to him and we'll be like, "What up, man? We were reading about you the other day, and I already know all about you. But what I don't know is this, this, and this, and like, how was it? Like, what? How much money did you take? What? What's going on? So it's it's fascinating seeing all that type of stuff. So let's go to. Um, Oh man, oh gosh. Reckless. Explain the contradiction of Ahaziah and age difference. Um, you know, it's so, it's so funny to me. People want to look so hard to find a contradiction and they don't spend any time trying to uh, uh, find the reason for themselves because the answer is out there. They just, they just don't want to look for that. They're just looking for the, they only find what they want to see. <laughs> Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and get into uh, Philemon and Philemon verse 17. Philemon verse 17. It says, if then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. Man, that is heavy. But then he goes on verse 18. And he, and so this is where, this is where, um, Paul is about to hand over to Philemon his credit card. He's about to hand over his credit card and be like, hey, whatever he owes, charge it to my account. And so that's what we're about to get into here in verse 18. And Philemon verse 18, it says, but if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. Man, so my account. So here in verse 18, this is talking about the doctrine of imputation. If you guys remember, when you get justified, there's three tenses within uh, uh, salvation. You uh, Justification, sanctification, and glorification. Past tense is justification. That is when you are declared righteous. He imputes you with righteousness. So that's the imputation here. So in verse 18... Uh, that's, that's, that's exactly what happened to you and I, my sins were placed on his account, justification, the whole Barabbas type situation. Barabbas was just standing there completely guilty, should have received the death penalty. And then there's Jesus who did absolutely nothing wrong and he was innocent. So you have an innocent and a guilty, the guilty goes free. The innocent takes his place. And that's that, that whole imputation. It's the whole visual type situation. And that's, what's going on here where Paul is now doing that for Onesimus in verse 18. He says, but if he has wronged you or owes you anything, Put that on my account. That is that is that is an interesting thing. And it's so, you know, just talking about imputation, it takes more than love to solve a problem, right? It takes more than love to solve a problem. Love, love must pay that price, right? So the Bible says in John 3 16, for God to love the world. Okay, that's all fine and dandy, right? But the, it, there needed to be more. There needed to be more. Love had to pay a price and the debt must be paid. So for God to love the world, that he gave his only begotten son. That was the, like, that was the price that was required. That was what, so the same concept here that Paul is doing is what Jesus did. And so Paul is imitating Christ and he's, he's interceding on 
Onesimus's behalf. He's like, if he owes you anything, charge it to my account. That's what Jesus did for you and I. Jesus is just like, <laughs> he's like, whatever they did, Father, put that on my account. He became he who knew no sin became sin for us. That's what's going on. So here in verse 18, he says, but if he have wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. I want you to view that verse from with with a conversation between Jesus and the Father. So obviously this is a conversation between Paul and Philemon, but I want you to view it because that verse can be applied to Jesus toward the Father. Because if you look at it through that kind of lens, imagine Jesus saying, Father, if he has done anything wrong or wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. And it's just like, man, unbelievable, unbelievable. So it takes more than love, more than love to solve a problem. And that is why Jesus had to come and had to die. Um, verse 19, in verse 19, moving on, it says, I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. Okay, so this is, it's an interesting thing. Uh, verse 19. So Paul says, I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. Now, OK, so Paul had a, a, a amanuensis, which was just basically a, secu a secretary of sorts. So somebody was writing Paul's letters down and that's documented in these epistles because Paul had a Paul had a bad eyesight ever since he had that encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. That his eyesight never seemed to be the same. Um, that's why Paul mentions like a couple, like he says, that's why I write in these large letters, like all capital letters. Um, people who read what he wrote were probably like, why is Paul yelling at me? He's writing in all caps. Um, but he talked about how people were willing to give their own eyes for Paul. Like, so, th so the thorn in the flesh was, could have possibly been the whole eye problem. Um, but here in verse 19, Philemon, verse 19, it says, I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. So you have this visual here where the, the secretary, whoever it might have been, is writing everything Paul is saying down. And then Paul reaches over and he takes it. And then he takes, so Paul takes the quill and then starts writing it down with his own hand, almost as like a, like a, like a, um, like it's, 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 it's binding. It's, it's official. It, it is. He's binding himself. He's like, I'm signing it. You know how you like sign on the dotted line. He's like, this is me. And so Paul take, you have this visual where Paul takes it and starts writing. He's like, this is my guarantee that I will repay. And so he's, he's writing on the dotted line in a sense. So in verse 19, it says, I, Paul am writing with my own hand. I will repay. Not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. That's fascinating. I don't know why. Maybe this is because Paul won Philemon to the Lord. If Paul won Philemon to the Lord, then um, that could possibly be what he's referring to. Be like, hey, listen, Philemon, don't you forget where you came from and such were some of you, buddy. <laughs> he's like, when you don't know, you don't know any better. You know, that's why it's so interesting how we look around the world. There's people who are in sin and they're just doing like if they're lost, they're only doing what lost people know how to do. And so we need to we need to look at them with those types of eyes, because if you're a one year old, you're only going to do what a one year old knows how to do. Thanks, Judy. You if you're if you're two years old or if you're completely lost, you're going to do what lost people do. And that means you're going to be jumping in the mud puddles and you're going to like have fun and get it all over your, in your hair. And you're going to get a mess in your face and you're going to you're going to walk into your house and mud all over the place. And that's what they do because they don't know any better. And so it's important for you and I to remember where we've came from. And so that's kind of what Paul seems to be alluding to here because he's like, Hey Philemon, he's like, remember how much you owe me. He's like, I'm not even going to bring it up, but I'm kind of going to bring it up a little bit here. So he's like, don't worry about it. Remember that thing that I did for you? Don't, I'm not going to bring it up, but I'm kind of bringing it up right now. It's kind of like what he's doing here in verse 19. All right. So in verse 20, it says, yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord refresh my heart in the Lord. And so this verse is, um, this <laughs> tapped into the next life. <laughs> oh, that's funny, Laura. But in verse 20, it says, yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Now this is like, I love this verse. 
I love this verse because Paul is like the the highest out of all the apostles, right? Even though he refers to himself as the least of the apostles, he's he wrote the most epistles in the entire New Testament. So you can view him as like he's a very important person, right? So with that in mind, Paul in verse 20 says, yes, brother. And he refers to him again as brother. He's like, yes, brother. And then he, he you can almost feel like a softer sense starting to approach. At least that's how I take it. Maybe you see it differently, but it says in verse 20, it says, yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. So he's, he's not, he's almost like he's lowering himself. He's like, let me, because that, that, that's an ask. That is an asking. Like, I'm not commanding you. I'm asking like, can, please, can you let me, can you let me have this? Like if, if now imagine how that would come across from somebody like, let's say, the CEO of your company, whoever you work for comes to you and you're just like, you know, just like a regular, you know, middle of the pack type of person. The CEO comes to your office and just is like, do you mind if I, do you mind if I do this? And they're asking for your approval. They're asking for your green, the, the thumbs up, the green light. And so how would that come across when somebody like way up here lowers themselves below you, even though they know they're above you, but they take that stance. And I'm just like, I love that because that's Paul again. Paul, it means least the little one. He is, he, he, he wants to be so low. Yeah, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm the chief of sinners. I am the least of the saints. And he's like, yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Man, I love that. I love that so much. Humility. <laughs> You can't talk enough about humility, but in verse 21, it says, having confidence in your diso or in your, <laughs> not in your diso, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. So Paul is writing in prison. He's writing this prison epistle. He's writing it to Philemon. And then he's starting, he's starting to wrap it up. And he's like, I'm ha I got confidence that you're going to be obedient that I write to you. And I don't know that you're going to do more than what I say. And so this is where some believe that this is Paul inferring uh, that he should free uh, Onesimus. This is where some people think that Paul is like telling him, he's like, hey, I know you're going to do more than what I'm actually saying to you right now. And, you know, I mean, that's what some people believe. So you can make your own opinion on that. I don't think it really matters one way or the other, but this is what some people believe. Um, so um, just because he says, knowing that you will do even more than I say. So, okay. Um, let's get to verse 22. So in verse 22, it says, but meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers, I shall be granted to you. <laughs> this is so, this is so funny to me. Okay. Um, so just to kind of recap, you have Paul writing to Philemon and he's laying it on thick. He's like, hey, brother, 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 family. We've all heard about your great love and faith and stuff for Jesus Christ and for the, 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 the all those that are in Christ. I mean, including Onesimus. And he's like, brother, brother, brother. And then he says, I'm not commanding. I'm appealing. And then he lowers himself here. I don't want it to be compulsory, uh, like a compulsion. I want it to be voluntary. And then he goes in, in verse 20, he says, yes, brother, let me. So he's like, please. And then here in verse 22, it just cracks me up. Because in Philemon verse 22, it says, but meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me. <laughs> <laughs> because Paul's like, I'm going to, I'm going to come check on it. I'm going to see if this is actually happening. It is so funny. Um, it is so funny to see how he's like, prepare a room for me because I trust through your prayers. I shall be granted to you. So it's like, so imagine again, being Philemon, I, I want you to imagine you're Philemon. You're the master of your home. You're reading this letter in front of your wife and your son. And then you have your church congregation there and you're reading it, and then you're like, oh, I guess Paul's going to come visit us because we're praying fervently for him to get out of prison so he can come visit visit us. And okay, Onesimus, I suppose, I guess, ha, I forgive you? And it's just like one of these, it's, a, it's just a funny thing. I, I find this very funny. I find this very funny. Um, the, where it says in verse 22, where it says, but meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers, the your there is plural. So he's again, so there's a singularity going on in verse four. And here in verse 22, it's through your prayers. 
meaning the church is praying for Paul because that's what they should have, that's what they should have been doing. And that's what they were doing. So through your plurality, uh, referring to the church, your prayers, I shall be granted to you. So, and then you get to verse 23 and you get a Paphras. Um, that's who we think is, uh, Paul is hearing all of this from, from a Paphras because a Paphras was all over the place. But in verse 20, Philemon 23 says a Paphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus greets you as do Mark, Aristocrus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. Now, uh, Demas or Demas or however you want to say it, Demas, um, he, this guy in verse 24, Demas, we've talked about Mark before. John Mark, he was the guy hit Paul and Mark. You know, they got into this big old thing and then Paul and Barnabas, they split up because of Mark. So Barnabas and Mark went one way and it was uh, Paul and Timothy or it went the other way. Um, but anyways, Paul and Mark ended up getting back on good terms, but here, this guy in verse 24, Demas, um, Demas is what, 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 um, what is known about him is that he did not, uh, he, he kind of dropped off. He kind of got burnt out and then fell back into the, you know, the world in a sense. And so he kind of lost his way at the end of his life. And so it's just an interesting thing because the name of the game to, from what we are seeing, at least from Paul's perspective, is to finish well, finish well. And we need to encourage one another to do that because there's like, there's dark days, right? Like we all get locked up in this life and it's just so, so tough. And we look around and it's like negative, 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 negative. Where's the good stuff in the world? Where is it? I don't see it. And then it's just, we need to. And so when you have a brother and sister in Christ, you got to hang on to them because it's like, I need to encourage you because if I encourage you, then you're going to want to encourage me. And then if we keep encouraging one another, then when I'm down, you'll be able to lift me up. When you're down, I'll be able to lift you up. And so Demas fell down at the end of his race. And so the, we need to finish well, we need to keep on going. Um, but verse 25, it says the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So we talked about this before in Philemon verse four, it says, I think my God making mention of you, that you right there in verse four is singular. So he's writing to Philemon, but verse 25 tells us that this letter was, in, it was intended for all of us because he's, he, it's a plurality going on there. And you, we would be able to re see that or notice that if we, uh, read Greek or spoke Greek. But it says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Um, so this, obviously, we talked about this before. Paul, every time he ends his epistles, if you if you read uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 17, um, the church in Thessalonica got a forgery, a forgery of a letter. And so they received a letter that was not from Paul, but it was as if it was from Paul. And so Paul writes them 2 Thessalonians, and he's like, hey, if you... If you ever get a letter and it doesn't have this at the end of it, it's not from me. And so Paul tells him what the, his signature is going to be. And so that's that's we're, we, we're given that in Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse 17, because in Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse 17, it says the salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle. So I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So every time you see the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all or grace incorporated in a salutation, that is that is uh, that is a very that that is uh, 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 that, that, that that's Paul all day. And so that's another reason why we believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, because it says grace be with you. Like it doesn't like he doesn't sign his name because he knew if his name was attached to the letter, then the letter, then the message wouldn't be received as well. So Paul removes himself from Hebrews completely, but you still see a whole bunch of Pauline type of style writing all throughout the book of Hebrews. And so if you've been throughout all these studies with uh, like, as we, because we've been going through so many studies of just focusing on Paul lately, if you go reread Hebrews and you know everything that you know, since we've studied everything up to this point, then you go read Hebrews again, you're going to be like, that's Paul, that's Paul, that's Paul. That's Paul. Like it's Paul all over the place. And so it's not that big of a deal, but it is just something to be mindful of. And it's kind of cool if you start paying attention to that type of stuff, because if you start keying in on certain patterns of a person, then that means you're learning and that means you're paying attention. And so that's that's a fun thing. OK, so that is um, that is Philemon. That is Philemon. That is uh, we did that in about an hour. So that wasn't too long. Right. Um, yay. 
that was the shortest book we have ever done, ever. If we do Jude, it's not going to be that short. I'm just telling you right now. Um, helps me a lot. Oh, thank you, Deb. I'm glad you like the recaps. Are you talking about the recaps on TikTok? Because I stopped doing that on uh, YouTube just because I'm like, I, I don't know if, I don't know. Um, I feel like I know Paul, Paul so well. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Okay, so we can go ahead and let's go ahead and go over to 1 Corinthians because now we're going to dive into a new book. And so you'll have to excuse my brain because I was trying to figure out, I was like, man, if we, are we just going to do Philemon tonight and just have like an hour long session? I'm like, man, nobody wants to do an hour long session. Boo. Um, we want four hours. I know guys, you just, you just want, so yeah, no, I'm just, <laughs> just kidding. I am so blown away that you guys, some like, it's funny because there's people who stay here the entire time that we're live. And I think it's so neat. I'm like, man, good for you guys who want to hang out for that long because nobody would go to church. Like, would you guys actually go to church and sit in church and listen for four hours and just be like, uh-huh. Okay. Like that blows my mind. That blows my mind. Um, okay. Why are you not there on YouTube? I am on, I am on, uh, YouTube 1920. Um, I would, I was, um, if you guys, yeah, if you guys wanted to go, um, check that out, there's a YouTube up in my TikTok profile. If you guys want to go follow that YouTube, uh, page, you could do that because I said, you know, if they cancel, if they ban TikTok, I don't have any other social medias. I don't got Twitter or Facebooks or anything like that. So, um, YouTube is the only other thing I got. And I upload all of these TikTok lives up there. So if you ever feel like doing a deeper dive on any kind of book, um, all those studies are up there. Revelation was a great one. That's the first one we started. And now here we are, I don't know, like 16 books later. And now we're about to dive into first Corinthians and stuff. So, um, quick question. How often do you do Bible study lives? Uh, um, completed Romans through Philemon. What's next? We're going to do first Corinthians, Lisa. Um, how often I, I, uh, Deb, I tried to do, um, I tried to, we try to go live about three times a week and it's random. So it could be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It could be Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It could be Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It, it just depends on the week. So, um, yeah, here is the, here's the YouTube just without the at symbol. So if you type in TT replays on YT, that it just stands for TikTok replays on YouTube. I should probably change that. I don't know if I can. Um, Habakkuk. <laughs> I don't think I've had anybody ever yell Habakkuk at me um, before, but you know what? There's a first time for everything. Habakkuk. <laughs> I don't, I don't know why that, that made me laugh. Um, okay. I'm going to put you guys on pause for about 20 seconds and then we'll come back and we'll get right back into, hello, Kelly. We're going to get right back into, uh, we'll dive into and we'll start first Corinthians chapter one. So give me 20 seconds and then we'll, we'll get right back into it. So hold please dive into, and we'll start first Corinthians chapter one. So give me 20 seconds and then we'll, we'll get right back into it. So hold please. <sighs> oh, Pretty intriguing, but smallest book, book of profit. Hello, Kelly. Okay, um, so if you guys are new here, thank you so much for being here. My name is Ryan. We have been going through each book verse by verse or expositionally. And um, if you guys go to, do you guys go to a church? Hey, thank you, baby gravy. Um, thanks. Hello, Lisa. So excited for Corinthians. Oh no. <laughs> well, we're only doing chapter one tonight. Um, it's an interesting book. Thank you, baby gravy, baby gravy. Um, but it, we're, does anybody here go to a church where the pastor goes through each book verse by verse by verse by verse, like starting from front to end and goes through all, the entire book and then goes to a different book and does the exact same thing? Does anybody do that? Unfortunately not. No, nope. Amber does. All right, guys, you need to go to Hawaii. Um, Lisa, I wish. Yeah, I hear that. Nope. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, you know, and you know, everybody has their own style, I suppose, but if you have the opportunity to, it's just the amount of information that you would learn 
even if the guy, even if the pastor doesn't talk on every, like expound on every letter um, or on, on every word or verse, even if he doesn't do that, the fact that it's going, like he would be going through verse by verse by verse. Sometimes if you just hear somebody read to you, you're just like, what? I've never heard that before. I've been a Christian for 30 years, right? Like that's a, so the benefit of just sitting down and reading. And then sometimes if you don't want to read, just pushing play and just let the, like, like let an app read to you. Like when I drive, I, I told you guys this before, like I, I listen to books on tape. Um, is that what it's called anymore? Books on whatever, uh, but it, it, um, books on tape. Yeah. But it, it's just, it's, uh, hearing it, it kind of hits you differently sometimes than when you read it. Sometimes when you're reading it, you're just kind of like your eyes are just moving, but you're not uh, retaining any of the information. So when you, if you find a church and the pastor's actually going through it verse by verse, there's so much there to benefit from just because you're going through the whole council, the whole council of God. And it's so neat. And it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that it's not, you know, and I, you know, I don't want to throw any shade on, you know, those pastors that are not doing that. I just, for me, my, my preference is verse by verse, because I think that's where you learn the most. Um, audio books. There you go. Um, when I first read Corinthians one and two, I can't hold my tears. I have audible. <laughs> it's, it's so relaxing. Yes. Books on audio, audio books, literally almost two years to finish acts. Nice. Is that a year church? That's so cool. <laughs> Two years, my goodness. I've been with you uh, since Revelation. What's up, Chad? Very cool. I study King James Holy Bible. Good. Yeah, King James is solid. I uh, wish I could find a church. You can. You can. All right. So, all right. So, um, before we dive into 1 Corinthians, we're just going to do 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, the one thing I want you guys to know more than anything else is how to know for sure you can go to heaven. There's only one way. And that's by believing in Jesus, by putting your faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. The Bible says, for whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You need to believe that Jesus is God's son, that he led a sinless life, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day. And the Bible says, for whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So a lot of people like to think that you need to earn it. It's just not true. You cannot earn it. You do not deserve it. It is a free gift. Okay. So Corinthians, um, you'll have to um, bear with me on this one because uh, I, I'm scrambling. You know, my mind is moving from Philemon to 1 Corinthians. We're doing one chapter over here, one chapter over here. I don't think we've ever done this before. So here we go. So Corinthians is... Um, this, this is a, this is an interesting, why is my pinky? Um, this, 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 this epistle that Paul writes to the uh, church in Corinth, this church is known as the, uh, a little background of, uh, before we dive into chapter one, this church is known as the, the carnal church. They were very worldly and we're going to get a lot of information within the first couple chapters, but I need you to understand that this church is very carnal, very worldly. They were, you know how you were supposed to be in the world, but not of it. Well, this church was in the world and they were of it for the most part. And so they were very spiritually immature. They were babies within the faith. I don't know if there's any babies in here that, you know, somebody who might be like 50 years old who is in here, they might have just came to Christ like a week ago. You would view them as a child in the faith, even though they might be older than you. There are people who are children and they've been a child for 50 years. And it's just crazy. I'm just like, man. So that's that's the unfortunate thing of the world, um, that people are underdeveloped. They don't, they don't, they don't try to grow and there, you have the option to grow. A child will grow if they are fed. I mean, you see these skinny things and then you see the ones that are like, okay, you're eating way too much. Um, but it's just a funny thing, but these people are, uh, they, they are not separated from the world. So you, what would you say? They are unseparated from the world, which means they are still attached to the world. <laughs> um, but the city of Corinth was a major influence to the world. And back during their time, Corinth, hey, thank you, Brown. 
Um, Corinth became an idiom for fornication. So it's interesting because, you know, as we talked about, we've been in first and second Corinthians a handful of times since throughout these studies. And you've heard, you know, the, the, the words like it's, it's first and second Corinthians, or we could say first and second Californians. Um, and I, and I'm only doing that just to kind of get you through the idea tr to try to get you to understand that Corinth, it was this very prosperous, like huge city where there was tons of people. And it's, it was a combination of uh, California, Las Vegas, and New York all rolled into one ball. Hey, thanks, Lisa. It was all rolled into one ball. And that is what I want you to think of when you think of Corinth. It was fornication. The idiom was, if you said Corinth, or hey, you're a Corinthian, then you would automatically have this stigma attached to you as you're messed up and you're highly involved in fornication. Because during this time, there were these, um, they, were, they were big into uh, mythology. And so within Corinth, they had these temples that were built for all of these gr Greek gods. They were so, like everywhere you would look, there would be a Greek God, Greek God, Greek God, or a goddess. So for example, they had a temple that was uh, built for specifically for Aphrodite. And so they had a thousand, over a thousand prostitutes that were within the area. And Aphrodite, thank you, Lisa, Aphrodite was the goddess of beauty, of lust, of, uh, you know, procreation type thing, um, of love. And so you had this temple and all of these people in the area were being influenced by the people who were outside of the temple, which were these thousand prostitutes. And so can you imagine walking around and just trying to go buy a loaf of bread and just looking like down the street and you just see all of this just just stuff, fornication, you know, happening? That's the that, that's the, that's the environment where this church was written to. This was a church in the middle of a mud puddle. That's what's going on. So when you think of Corinthian or first and second Corinthians, like Californians should type kind of come to mind. And I'm not dissing, you know, if anybody's here from California, I'm just saying the lifestyle, it's like a, a, you have licentiousness, you have lawlessness running rampant, like right is wrong, wrong is right. It's that kind of world. And everybody's going okay with the wrong way of going. It's like going, if you go with the flow in the world, then you're going the wrong way because the world is going the wrong way. So you need to go push against the grain. It's why the Bible says broad is the way that leads to destruction and narrow is the gate that leads to life. And few there are that find it. There's going to be a lot of people. The majority, if you if you study, if you pay attention to patterns throughout the Bible, the majority in the Bible is almost always wrong. The majority in the Bible is almost always wrong. The the people of Israel, every time they would follow, they would always follow their leaders. It's crazy. Paying attention to them. Like wherever the leaders would go, that's where the people would go. Wherever the leaders would go, that's where the people would go. If the leaders were right, the people were right. If the leaders were wrong, the people were wrong. And so when they went into idolatry, then the people went into idolatry. When they were went to and they fell before the Lord, the people fell before the Lord. So that's like the trend within the Jewish world. And um, so Paul is writing, going to be writing this, or he, he wrote this letter to the church that was in Corinth, which is in modern, which is in Greece. And um, it, uh, Corinth was a type of a, um, a, a a melting pot. So you know how America is like the melting pot, right? Like everybody from all across the world, they come together and here we are. That's kind of like what Corinth was because Corinth had the Greeks, they had Latins, they had Syrians, they had Jews, they had everybody and anybody and they all came together. And that is the area that was, that was what Corinth was. Um, so they also, they didn't only uh, worship Aphrodite by herself. There were other gods there like Apollo or Poseidon or Hermes or Athena. They had all those other uh, Greek gods that they worshiped as well. But Corinth was essentially the center of paganism. That is bananas. Um, I mean, the center of paganism. If you, if you went and you traveled, but your home was from Corinth and you were a Corinthian, you know how you're an American, like we're American. So if you leave America, you're, you go to another country, you're like, yeah, I'm an American. Same is true for Corinthians there. If you were from Corinth, you were a Corinthian. And so 
whenever anybody heard you were from Cor Corinth, they would look at you and you'd be like, everybody knew, everybody knew, everybody in the world, they knew what was going on in Corinth. It was the center of paganism. Um, so Paul ended up going to Corinth back in Acts. Let's go to Acts chapter 18 because um, it's 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 uh, it's we get a little bit of information about it in Acts chapter 18. Um, in Acts chapter 18, it says Acts chapter 18, verse one. This is where the, the founding of the church at Corinth. So um, in Acts chapter 18, verse one, it says, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. Um, in verse two, it says, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, who recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for by occupation, they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Now, here in verse four, it's just so interesting to pay attention to the word persuade. Now, the, I, I just find that fascinating because Paul says uses the word persuade multiple times throughout his epistles. But Paul, wherever he was going, he was persuading people, and he was per, he, he was he was contending for the faith, and he was he was trying to um, he was um, he, he was always contending for the faith, and he was trying to. Uh, defend the faith no matter where he went so that he might try he might win some he was always trying to win people for the lord and then you know he's like i am persuaded that in who in whom i have believed that uh you know um that he is able to keep what i have committed unto him against that day um he persuaded he, he is persuaded 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 so the question on the table here is can you persuade somebody to christ because you have to sometimes sometimes it's just not enough to say hey jesus loves you like how far does that go? Like, I mean, it only goes a little bit. And then they're like, what do you mean? Then you have to persuade them. Like you might've just got their attention, but then you have to persuade them and, and show them and tell them. But here in Acts chapter 18, verse uh, uh, four, it says, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. He was uh, bilingual in a sense. He was able to speak Jewish language and he was able to speak Greek language. He was able to talk to him. If you were a Jew, he could talk to you how Jew needed to be talked to. If you were Greek, he could talk to you how Greek needed to be talked to. But it says, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. And when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Now, we know that Paul's ministry was to the Gentiles, but he had a heart for the Jewish people. That is nothing new. We've talked about that a ton of times. Um, so here in verse uh, 7, Acts chapter 18, verse 7, it says, And he departed from there and entered a house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. So um, here we have the Corinthians. Many Corinthians heard, and then after they believed, then they got baptized. That is what we need to be doing as a Christian. If you come to Christ, you give your you you get saved by faith and faith alone. Once you get saved you should get water baptized. That's just how it would be. Um, Agent Smith, false. <laughs> what the word? <laughs> what? Oh, man. Okay. Um, so, so baptism doesn't save you. Baptism is what we should end up being uh, and should do just by, after we come to Christ, we should do it. It, it does not save you. Uh, we know that is salvation is obtained through faith and faith alone. Now, there are other people who would argue against that, and you need to be mindful of those people, and you need to know what you know, and you need to know why you know it. I believe salvation is obtained through faith alone, but other people will say, no, it's faith and baptism, and you need to obey the law. So where do you land? Where do you land? So um, so when you go to 
um, verse 9, Acts chapter 18, verse 9, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night vision, Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Okay, so it continues on. We, we can pretty much end there, but let's go back to Corinthians. All right. So that is where you're introduced to Paul and Corinth. So Paul ends up founding this church in Corinth. He goes to Corinth, he founds this church, and then he leaves. And so after he leaves, he ends up writing a letter to them. Um, but he he ends up going to Corinthians, as we find. If you guys want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, he goes to, to Corinth. To Corinth uh, and it says that he's like, I was with you in weakness in fear and in much trembling. It's interesting because Paul went to Corinth alone because um, Silas and Timothy, they were still back in Macedonia. So Paul ends up going to Corinth all by himself. But the reason for first Corinthians, the reason why this letter was written was because the household of Chloe brought him news of cliques that were happening or divisions that were happening within the church. So if you want to scroll, if you want to scroll or just look at first Corinthians chapter one, verse 11, just so you can kind of get a little bit of an oversight in first Corinthians chapter one, verse 11, it says, for it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household that there are contentions among you. So this is the reason why the letter was written because there were, so Paul is addressing, um, so Paul received a letter from Corinth and now he is responding to the letter that he received. And there is divisions within the, the church and he is going to be addressing that. Um, so we know that the church wrote him a letter because let's go to Corinthians chapter seven in Corinthians chapter seven, verse one in Corinthians chapter seven, verse one, it says, uh, first Corinthians chapter seven, verse one, it says now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So you have this whole corresponding going on between Corinth and, um, Paul himself, what is going on here in the chat? We got a and agent Smith. Are you, um, Mr. Anderson from, uh, what's it called? Matrix man. Why you got to come in here and cause a ruckus? Don't you have anything better to do? It's three in the morning, my, my man. <laughs> okay. Romans nine thirteen, Malachi one, three. Okay. Well, I'm just going to go ahead. I, I'm, I'm going to have to meet you, my man. Sorry about it. Sorry, buddy. Okay. Um, but you have this type of corresponding going on between the two. Um, sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting distracted. Okay. Um, I will, I will refocus, bring it back. Okay. So in first Corinthians chapter seven, verse one, it says now concerning the things of what you wrote me, and so that's that's in first Corinthians chapter seven, verse one. So Paul is telling us that they first wrote him a letter because there were some problems going on. So there's some problems going on in the church at Corinth. The church in Corinth initiates conversation with Paul. They write him a letter. Paul gets the letter. He reads it. He's told all these things by the people who end up delivering that letter to him, because, you know, if a letter to get a letter from Corinth gets to Paul, there needs to be somebody hand delivering that letter. And so he gets this letter and he reads all about what's going on in Corinth and he was already there. And so now he's hearing about what's going on. And so that's why he's, he, he's addressing it. So, um, they, they reached out to him first, but Paul visited Corinth multiple times. So we can look up some of those. So let's go to second Corinthians chapter two, um, in second Corinthians chapter two, uh, verse one, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, uh, it says, But I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. So we have this, it's implied that he was already there. He's like, I'm not going to come to you again in sorrow. So he was already there. So he's there multiple times. But let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, 
we get more information about this whole relationship between Paul and Corinth. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, it says this, Now for the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I do not seek yours but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And so you have... Paul is like, I'm ready to come to you for the third time. And then we go to one page over in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And 2 Corinthians chapter 13, we get more information again. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, it says, This will be the third time I am coming to you. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. So there's clearly interaction going on between Corinth right? So they're, they're, they're communicating with one another. Paul's going back and forth. There's multiple trips, multiple letters. Um, and that is, uh, um, that, that's kind of a basic, uh, overview of what's going on here. But some believe that Paul wrote a severe letter that was lost. And so there's some language that is used in first Corinthians and in second Corinthians that imply that there was a letter that was written to them and it got lost. And so because Paul says some things, he's like, I wrote to you about this. I wrote to you about this to you before. And we like when we search the scriptures, we don't see where the things that he is mentioning, that's nowhere to be found. And so it's implied that a letter is not here. We don't have it now. Obviously, you know, I don't make a big deal about that, but it is something to be mindful of. Um, for example, it said, uh, um, so there are at least three visits that Paul did to Corinth, and there might be up to three to four letters that were there or that Paul wrote. So we have first and second Corinthians, but it might have been first Corinthians, second Corinthians, third Corinthians and fourth Corinthians for all we know. But it's just an interesting kind of dynamic. And so I'll, um, so the first visit is when the church was founded. That's what we went back. And we, when we went to Acts chapter 18, that was when Paul first went there to Corinth. That was when the church was founded. The second um, time he visited was during the painful visit, which we'll talk about later. And then the third one was a visit after Second Corinthians had been sent. And we already went to Second Corinthians chapter 13 because he was saying, he's like, I'm ready to come to you the third time. So th those are three visits that he ended up making to Corinth. Now, as far as the letters are concerned, there are maybe up to four letters, but the first letter referred to as the previous letter. Um, that's kind of, we'll, we'll tackle that when we get there. The second letter is what we know as 1 Corinthians. And then the third letter is the severe letter that has been lost. Because if you read 2 Corinthians, you see how he was worried about how his letter came across to them. And he was like, oh, did it offend you? I, you know, was I too harsh? And so he, Paul gets word that it, everything worked out and it was everything was OK. And so he was relieved. And so that that's the that's the that's the third letter, which is the severe letter, which, you know, we don't know much about because we don't have it. And then the fourth letter would be what we know as second Corinthians. And I don't make a big deal about that. I'm just giving you the idea of what some scholars believe to be true. Some people are like, Hey, there were multiple letters going on here. And a lot of people don't talk about that. I'm just, I'm just giving you that information just so you can be mindful of it. Because if you pay attention to the language through that, that Paul uses and what he references it doesn't make sense. Like some of the things that he says, he's like, he, he references things. And if you read it, you're like, what is he talking about here? I like, I have no idea what he's referring to. And so that's why people come to the conclusion that there were other letters that we do not have. Now, does that mean that God failed at keeping his whole word together? No, absolutely not. We have what we need to have right here. And everything we have right here is perfect and it is complete. So that is good to know. Okay, so that is a little bit of an overview about uh, Corinthians, but the main takeaway is that this church was, it, 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 look at it as the first and second Californians, if you will. Look at this church as California, Las Vegas, New York, all balled up into one, and that is what Corinth is, except, you know, Corinth was much worse than that. They were, you know, thousands of prostitutes outside the temple, seducing all types of people, all kinds of fornication. Terrible. Hello, Holly. Um, okay. Hopefully, hopefully uh, that's just a little, little review before we dive in. 
So hopefully, hopefully that, hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. But this is a very, very carnal church, and so this is going to be encouraging for some people here. That uh, we'll we'll get to it. Okay, and so in First Corinthians chapter one, in First Corinthians chapter one, verse one, it says, "Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother." Sosthenes. Now say that word three times fast, and I don't even want to say it again, but I'm going to have to eventually. But okay, just in case you guys are new here, because I don't know, Paul is the guy that we've been studying forever. Paul, he, he used to be Saul. Paul, his name means least or little one. So he used to be the most like, like way up here in his society when he was lost, when he was, when he you know, persecuted the church. Then when he came to Christ, he lowered himself. So he was way down here. He, he chose the name Paul, which means little one or least. And so Paul, it says in verse one, and Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. So an apostle is one that is sent forth. Um, and it says Paul called to be an apostle. And so he was quite literally called. I mean, he was on the road to Damascus and he was called. And Jesus tells us about that um, in the book of Acts. He called Paul, he called Paul to be an apostle. apostle. Um, there are specifications that are uh, required to be an apostle. Um, those are all given to you in Acts chapter 1. You need to be with them during John the Baptist uh, or the baptism of John. And then you had to witness the resurrection. And so there's these qualifications to be one of the apostles. But the word apostle means sent forth. Um, okay, so First Corinthians chapter one, verse one, it says, "Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother." So Sosthenes, he's the guy who was mentioned back in Acts chapter eighteen. So if you go back to Acts chapter eighteen, verse seventeen, um, Acts chapter eighteen, verse seventeen. It says, um, Acts chapter 18, verse 17, it says, the, then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, Sos, Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. So there you have the introduction to Sosthenes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Sosthenes, uh, he was the Jewish synagogue ruler that we just read about in Acts chapter 18, verse 17. I don't like that name. Can you imagine, like, did his parents hate him or something like that? Who names people that? I can't pronounce it very well. I have to, like, separate it into two words. Sauce, like tomato sauce, and then Thanese. Uh, Sosthenes because I can't say it together. It's just not happening. It's trying, it's, it's almost like saying toy boat three times fast. Can you guys, anybody in here, can anybody say toy boat three times fast? Try it right now. Say toy boat as fast as you can three times. Say it out loud and don't cheat. And if you did it, then let me know. And then I will call you a liar. I'm just kidding. I won't do that, but I, I'm going to need video proof that you actually did it. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, did, did anybody actually try it? Because that that's hilarious. It's physically impossible. <laughs> it just can't be done. You almost need, if you do it, just a little pro tip, because I've been trying this for years. It helps if you yell it, if you almost, you have to like really say it loudly. Um, and if you say it louder, then it kind of helps you enunciate because enunciating is the most difficult thing out of the entire part. I don't know why we're talking about toy boats. Focus, focus. Blondie tried it. <clears throat> okay, if we're 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 in we're 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 doing Bible stuff. My goodness, people. <laughs> I just <laughs> okay. First Corinthians chapter one. Um, Okay, so that's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Okay, so let's get to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. And it says, To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. So here in verse 2, I tried. It's hard. <laughs> So here in verse two, it, uh, it says to the church. Uh, um, so so the word church, if you guys remember the church, uh, it, it was born at Pentecost in Acts chapter two. So in Acts chapter two, you have the Feast of Pentecost. All the Jewish people came together. They had, they were required to show up for three feasts. And the Feast of Pentecost was one of those. So they all show up because they had to be there physically at the temple. And then um, at the Feast of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down. So in Acts chapter one, 
when Jesus ascends in Acts chapter two, the Holy Spirit descends and the church was born. The church means ecclesia. Ecclesia means the called out ones. If you are part of the church, you have been called out. And that's just so interesting. So because, you know, you pay attention to the language that Paul uses. He's like the elect, the call, the chosen, like the, you have been called. And so it's interesting when you think about church and ecclesia, ecclesia means called out. You have been called. What have you been called for? Like it's all call, call, call. It's like these wordplay that you pay attention to. And it's, it's obviously divinely inspired. And it's, it's, it's quite fascinating when you start connecting those dots. But in verse 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, it says, To the church of God, which is at Corinth. <clears throat> to Okay. So um, this is this is um this is interesting that he says uh, to the church of God. And so the reason why this is interesting is to there are people who believe you can lose your salvation. Okay, and so we're gonna we're gonna be we're going to be talking about this. I believe if you are saved, then you are always saved. Some people believe that you can lose your salvation. I do not believe that. I believe if you are saved, you are always saved. And here's a good, here's a perfect example. Because here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, Paul is writing to the church and he's writing to the, he said, he, he, he is going to expound on their position, where they are stand, their position, they're standing within Christ, right? And so he's going to build that up and he's going to affirm their position in Christ. And then he's going to lay the smack down on them, <laughs> but he's going to, he's going to tell them where they're standing. And I need you to remember and be sensitive to the fact that this church was in Corinth. Corinth had the stigma or it was an idiom for fornication. So this church was quite literally covered in mud they had very little doctrine. They were spiritual babies. They were undeveloped. They were walking around having no idea which way they were going. That's what this type of church was. And so here in verse 2, it says, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. Again, when you think of Corinth, when you hear Corinth, I want you to think of fornication or California, you know, just to kind of get the point drilled home. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul is saying this. He's talking, he's talking to this church. He's like, hey, you guys, you're sanctified. You are sanctified in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. This is fascinating because it, it's, it, it's so interesting to pay attention to what Paul does not say here. Paul does not, um, he, he does not threaten them with the loss of salvation. And now Paul is aware of what they're dealing with. They're dealing with all kinds of crazy stuff, right? Like they're going off the rails. So Paul is addressing the church and he is not ever threatening them. Not, not, not he's, he's never saying that, hey, be careful, you're going to lose your salvation, right? Because if he was going to do that, it would be to this church but he doesn't do it. And so I just think it's interesting to pay attention to the things sometimes that are not said because this church was extremely worldly and yet they were saved because Paul tells us, he says in verse two, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, called. When were you called? Pop quiz. When were you called? Before the foundation of the world, as Ephesians chapter one, verse four tells us in Ephesians chapter one, verse four, Ephesians one, verse four, it says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Sheesh, that is crazy. So he chose us before the foundation of the world. And he's talking to these people who are in the middle of this mud puddle. So that's what he's doing in first Corinthians chapter one. They were very worldly, yet they were saved. Fascinating. Going back to first Corinthians chapter one, verse two, it says to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Now, here's this here's this phrase with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. What I want you to pay attention to here is that Paul is addressing if you're born again, he's talking about you right there. Because it says, with all who in every place. That's me. Like, we call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like, he is our Lord and Savior. And so, that's a, that's us. That's all of us. We're You know, we're all in the same body. We're all one. It's crazy. So, we get to verse 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. And it says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, this is a very Pauline type 
Uh, Ephesians 1, 4, Laura, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. It says, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, very Pauline type of style. Nothing new here if you've been paying attention. Grace is always first and then peace. Now, be mindful. It's not grace, mercy, and peace. We just finished the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. All of those, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, had grace, mercy, and peace in the salutation. Here, in all the other epistles, it's grace and then peace. Grace, if you're here for our study of Romans, grace as an acronym, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's a good way to remember what grace stands for. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. Fascinating. But it's always grace first and then peace because you can't have peace unless you first have grace. So in verse three, it says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse four, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus. Again, okay, another Pauline, very, very Pauline type of style. Uh, this is mentioned in 1 Thessalonians. You could go look it up. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. It talks about pray without ceasing and giving thanks always. We need to always be giving thanks and praying without ceasing. So whenever you read about these Pauline epistles, be mindful of Paul's heart. He is always praying, quite literally, always praying. He's not just saying it for his own health to hear himself think. He is always praying. You and I need to be praying. He is always thanking God. You and I always need to be thanking God. Every breath we have is quite a blessing. We don't look at it as a blessing because we just take it for granted. Thank you, Sherry. We need to understand everything that we have. Every time we're able to blink our eyes or pick up a pencil or run across the room or pick up you know, shoes or walk to the refrigerator, whatever we're doing, it is a blessing. So constantly give thanks to God and remember what we have been given. But he says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus. You should put a brackets around the word given there in first Corinthians chapter one, verse four, because how did you get it? Did you earn it? No, it was given to you. Romans 3, 23, for the wages or for the wages of sin is, or, or for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's what that's Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's terrible. That's the death penalty right there. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is a gift. It is a free gift. It's like somebody's coming over for your birthday and they just hand you a gift. Whenever somebody hands you a gift, you don't just be like, well, what do I owe you? Huh? What do I got to do for it? No, it is a gift somebody is giving to you. And that's the concept here. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, it says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus. Now, there are people who want to add water baptism to the gift of God. And I will die on that hill all day. It is not something you can earn. It is not something you can do to deserve it. It is a free gift. It is quite literally, you need to put your faith. It's you doing nothing, him doing everything, you just believing. That's what it's all about. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5, it says that you were enriched in everything by him in all utter utterance and all knowledge. So what's interesting here is that he uses the past tense. Now, again, remember, he is writing to Corinth Corinth is a hot mess. They are complete. They're Christians, but they're covered in mud. That's basically what the idea that I want you to look at here. But Paul is saying in verse five, he says that you were enriched in everything by him, meaning past tense, meaning, yeah, you're, you were enriched like you and I, we've been enriched like past tense, like it's happened already. That you were enriched in everything by him and all utterance and all knowledge. So what I want you to be sensitive to that Paul is doing is before he gets into the meat and potatoes of this epistle is that he is first acknowledging their standing or or their position in Christ he is a before he's a, or he's acknowledging their position and standing in Christ before he addresses their problems and that's something that you and I can learn from because what you and I tend to do is we tend to address the problems before addressing somebody's where they're standing in Christ because sometimes people forget. And th this is why it's important to have assurance in Christ. And so I believe if saved, you're always saved. There are people who believe you can lose your salvation. And I'm just like, I can't imagine. I can't imagine like that would be terrifying because like if, 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 if it's on what my, per my opinion is of sin, 
if I, if, if it's on what I believe God would, whether like God would cast me away or whether he would keep me based upon how good I was today on how my behavior was today specifically. Hey, today I sinned 383 times. And I am so thankful I didn't sin one more time because if I did, God would have thrown me away and I would have had to come back to him and repent and uh, ask him to save me all over again. No, I, I, I can't like that. That kind of belief has to be so in, like it has to work up so much anxiety and worry. And so for me, and, you know, I'm not throwing any shade on people who believe that I just. I just, you know, because we believe the same gospel, but I believe if you are always saved, if you are saved, you are always saved. And so what Paul is doing here is he's not addressing them losing their salvation. He's not saying, hey, guys, you guys better square it away because you're you're messing in the mud puddle right now. He's not doing that. He's assuring them of their where they're standing in Christ. And so he's 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 building that up their position before he addresses their problems. And I think that's very fascinating. Okay. Um, so when you go to verse six, um, but what do you, what if you walk away from God on purpose, if you, so that's, you know, it, it's not on me, Deb, to really answer on whether you are saved or you are saved or you are saved or that person over there, that's not on me. And so what we should be doing is just telling people about Christ. And so once that, that's our, that's our mission. And so if somebody like, it's always interesting because that's the question on the, that's the age old question. I like, for example, the scenario on the table is. I knew this person, he was on fire for the Lord for 20 years, and then all of a sudden he completely turned away, and now he's living, and he's an atheist, and he hates God, and he talks about how terrible God is, because how could he allow God, God, an all-loving God, why would he allow all these, these things to happen, right? Like, that's the scenario. What, is that person saved, or is he not saved? Because once upon a time, he was on fire for the Lord, and I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. God knows the heart. It's a posture of the heart. And if it was genuine, then, you know, that's going to, that's going to be, that's, that's going to be between him and the Lord. And that's not on me to make that determination. But, um, you know, the Bible gives us, uh, something that is very, it's very interesting. The more you read it, the Bible provides a spiritual, uh, a divine tension, you know, like if you have a string and it's kind of like lack, like uh, there's slack. And then when you pull it, it tightens out and then it becomes like a straight line. But if you grow closer, then it's kind of like loosey goosey. But when you pull it, it gets that tension. So that's kind of like what the word of God does within us. It's just like, oh man. And so like, the more, you know, the more you feel like you got to start doing and like, and, and, and living out loudly. And so, you know, there's some people who don't have that much light. And so, you know, it's a different dynamic between each person. So I can't really speak on that. That's, you know, God, God knows their heart. And so, <laughs> You can only do what you can do. And so we need to just need to pray for those people because I don't know. I don't know if you're saved. You could tell me that you're saved, but you, you know, you might be lying to me. So um, it's between, you know, there's a lot of people who think they're going to heaven who are not going to heaven. There's a lot of people who aren't sure if they're going to heaven, who are probably going to go to heaven. And it'll be like, oh man, I can't believe it. And you know, like, it's like one of those things. It's like some people who really are convinced, like the most religious people in the world think they're going to heaven. They're lost. Those mega church pastors, those, you know, Joel Osteen's, those Benny Hens, those, all those types of people, they are some, you know, okay. Well, anyways, anyways, uh, first Corinthians chapter one, verse six in first Corinthians chapter one, verse six, it says, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you would come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here in verse seven, it says, so that you come short in no gift gift. Um, it's there. So, so you guys know how there are different words in the Greek for like, you guys, if you were here for our study of revelation, you know how, when it said another angel and the word another means allos or heteros, allos means another of the same kind. Heteros means another of a different kind. So if I said, Hey, I want this pen, but I want allos. I want another pen. That means I want this exact same pen. But if I said, hey, I want another pen, but it's heteros, that means I want another pen. And it could be any pen whatsoever. It could be a purple pen, blue pen, black pen, whatever pen. Just give me another pen. So there's different words, but our English version translate it to be the same way without giving the actual definition. So for example, so here in verse seven, the word gift uh, and where it says, so that you come short and no gift, the word gift there is charisma. Now there are different words in the Greek. Um, so if you go to Ephesians two, uh, verse eight, nine, where it says, for by grace, are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The word gift in Ephesians two, verse nine 
um, is different than the word gift here. This word gift here is charisma. The word gift in Ephesians 2 verse 9, I want to say, uh, begins with the letter D. I can't remember it off the top of my head. But my point here is, is that there's different meanings behind these words. And so it's good to, to unpack what they mean, because when you read an English word, you automatically assume that you understand what it's referring to. And that's something you need to train your mind to not think. You need to get over that and get back into the Greek and, you know, tap on a verse and see, because sometimes you'll, 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 you'll gain a better understanding. Anyway, the word here, gift is charisma. And so, um, it says so that you come short in no gift. Now it's these people here in Corinth, they, they ended up becoming more occupied on the gift, <laughs> on the gift rather than the giver. And so, you know, it's very, it's, it's very, um, applicable when you read revelation chapter two, because in revelation chapter two and three, you, you, you learn about the seven churches that receive letters from Jesus uh, you have those seven letters that received seven church, uh, the seven churches that received seven letters. But the first church that was mentioned in Revelation chapter two is Ephesus. If you remember about Ephesus, what was wrong with Ephesus? Ephesus w- was doing all of these good things. Jesus writes to them. They're like, hey, you're doing good. 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 And then after he builds them up, he says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you lost your first love. And so you have this church that was doing so many good things but they were so they, they, they chose doctrine over devotion. And so what God wants is he wants devotion over doctrine. And so where it's a it's a matter of your heart. The heart of the matter is always a matter of the heart. And so here, these people, they were more occupied on the gift rather than on the giver. And so you need to be mindful that there are people like I saw this. Very, hey, thank you, Wendy. There, there's like this. It's a cartoon type of uh, it was a, it was an illustration, essentially. But. There is this uh, like there is two booths set up and the first booth was like spiritual gifts. And like it was like line out the door, like everybody was lined up there. And then in the other booth, it had the it had the title up on it. It said uh, uh, sound doctrine. And so there was nobody in that line. And so it's just funny because people want all these spiritual gifts and they want to focus on these gifts. And it's all about gifts, 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 gifts. And then they don't, they, they, and, it, and they're, they're, people are putting the attention on things that they shouldn't be putting it on. And they're taking attention and they're taking it off of Christ and they're putting it on themselves because that's what they want to do. And it's just me, 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 me. And people get a sense of pride about this entire thing. And so you need to be very on, uh, on guard about this. Going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, it says, So that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here you have the word revelation. This word revelation is apocalypsis. Apocalypsis means unveiling. If you were here for um, our study of Revelation, you know, that's, we talked about that every time we went over our review, but uh, Revelation is apocalypsis. It means to unveil. Like, I want you to picture, like, you're sitting in the stands, and you're about to watch your kid perform a play at school or something like that, and they're all behind the curtain, and you hear all the noise back there, and they're, you know, the seats moving, and the, the chair squeaking, and the kids laughing, and falling it down, and, you know, crying, and all that type of stuff. You can't see them, because the curtain is there. But then right when the curtain is pulled, you start to see them. It is unveiling. And so that is why it's called the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. It is all about Jesus Christ. It's always been. It's never been about anything else. And we need to remember that because um, the more we do, the better our life will become or uh, uh, perspective wise. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, it says, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation or the unveiling of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so it says eagerly waiting um, in verse seven, eagerly waiting. And that is that uh, if you go to Romans eight twenty three, go to Romans chapter eight, verse 23. This is one of those times where um, eagerly waiting is used time and time again. In Romans eight, verse 23, it says, not only that, Romans 8, 23, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting 
for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So here again, you have the phrase eagerly waiting. And so you have it in Romans 8, 23, you have it in first Corinthians one, seven, you have in Romans, uh, you have in Galatians chapter five, five, you have it in Philippians three, 20, you have in Hebrews nine, 28, you have it in Romans chapter eight, verse 19, 23 and 25, but it's eagerly waiting, eagerly waiting. And it's the same word used time and time again. And this word is, um, this is always being directed towards Christ's return each time. So every time eagerly waiting is used, the word, the Greek word is apodekamai. And so every time apodekamai is used in the New Testament, it is always reference to the second coming. And so that's just very fascinating. So here is one of those times in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. It says, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is waiting. We like, I can't wait. Like I'm pumped up, but eagerly waiting. So moving on in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, it says, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so here you have um, you have this uh, you have this 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 phrase here, which is called the day of our Lord Jesus Christ or the day of Christ. So if you were here for our study of First and Second Thessalonians and other studies, we've talked about the day of the Lord compared to the day of Christ. So what is the difference? Are they the same thing? Is the day of the Lord the day of Christ? Are they the same thing? What's the difference here? They are not the same thing. And so this is important for you to dive in and unpack this for yourself. Don't just take my word for it, but they are two very, very different things. So an easy elementary way to look at it is the day of Christ is a good thing. It is always going to be a good thing. Every time you see the day of Christ, think good. Because if you're a Christian, that is, the, the day of Christ is a good thing. If you are born again, the day of Christ is a good thing. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment. You want to stay away from that. That's all bad. Bad news bears. Um, but, oh, thank you, Sherry. But the day of Christ, a, a good way to remember it, day of the Lord, day of Christ, the day of Christ, think Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is good. We love Jesus Christ. That is the way to remind you that the day of Christ is good. The day of Christ is good. But the day of Christ begins with the rapture. Okay, so right after the rapture begins, then then everything that proceeds from that on is going to be good for you and I. So that refers to the saints. But the day of the Lord is always used. If you go back in the Old Testament, it's always going to be about um, judgment, whether it's on Israel. And it's always going to be, you know, it's going to be poured out on Israel as well. That's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of Jacob. Jacob was called Israel, the time of Israel's trouble, Daniel's 70th week. You know, that's what the Daniel 9 prophecy is all about. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse um, 8, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. To the end. That's kind of cool, right? How long will uh, you be confirmed? To the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if you go back and you count how many times it talks about Jesus within these first 10 verses, nine, nine or nine verses, you're going to find it's, it's Jesus is mentioned like nine or 10 times. It's he, do you see where Paul is trying to bring the attention to. And, and so you you see Paul is bringing the attention to Jesus and so he's dealing with the church that is lost in the sauce and they don't know how to think. And so he's he's starting out his letter by saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And so if you know how to think and you start paying attention to patterns, you start seeing this type of stuff. You're like, well, wait a second. Like, I better start thinking about Jesus a little bit more because Paul is telling me he keeps talking about Jesus. And so that's what we need to be doing. So it just might it's just something to take note of. But our position in Christ uh, versus our walk is uh, what he's going to start talking about. So you, he, he's, he, he talks about the, our position in Christ or their position in Christ. And now he's going to start talking about their walk, um, like our Christian conduct, if you will. But it, it's interesting because if you look at our like once you know where you are in Christ, if you are a Christian, you're in Christ. But how's your walk? How's your walk? If you type in your blue letter Bible, 
uh, walk worthy and you just hit search and it searches the entire Bible, it'll probably pop up like four or five different times. And it's always going to be in the Pauline epistles because Paul is telling us to walk worthy, walk worthy, walk worthy, walk worthy. We need to be walking worthy of for, you know, so that we can be ambassadors for Christ. So your walk is impor- important. Okay, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, um, now we're going to be moving on. It's going to be talking about the divisions that uh, were going on, um, that Paul was, you know, the, the cliques that were happening within the church or the household of Chloe. We're, we're going to talk about the household of Chloe. There's not much known about her. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, um, well, you know, th- it says in verse 10, it says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, this verse, you know, OK, so Paul is dealing with a church and it's not he, he's not talking about denominational type of stuff where he's saying no divisions. He's not talking about non like non like uh, denominations. He's talking about people within the same church having divisions. Like if you and I are in the same room, you and I are battling and we're going to head to head and we're like, you're wrong and I'm wrong. And you're now we're fighting each other and you're like, okay, well, I'm going in this corner. You're going that corner. It's like, ding, ding, ding. And so it's, so we need to, so that's what he's, that's what he's trying to contend here. And so what we need to know, you know, that one quote we talked about, uh, Augustine, he, uh, he, he's, uh, he's the one who coined the term, but the, the quote that he is often known for is the quote, it says, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, but in everything, agape. And so if you think about that, in essentials, what are essentials? The doctrinal things, like what is sound doctrine? Well, that's found in 1 Corinthians 15. We'll get to there. But that is doctrinal. That is salvation. Salvation issues are primary. Everything else is secondary. So that's a way to view this. And that's how we need to be looking at one another. So if you stumble upon somebody who believes the same gospel on how to be saved, then that is everything. But then right when they start disagreeing with you on some other issue, now all of a sudden you're like, oh, I just, you know. And so you, you just like, hey, thanks, Ryan. I love your name. Um, but it's just interesting how we view things and we forget that we ourselves could possibly be wrong. And, uh, it just seems that we're right. And that's why it's so funny when people come in here and they're like, you're wrong. And I'm like, I I could be (laughs) like, it's the secondary thing. And I'm just like, ah, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can, but I'm never going to die on a hill unless it's the gospel. And that's what I, you know, that's the main thing to take away here. I could, I might be different if, you know, if, if we were doing like an actual church thing, I would be a little bit more direct because I think within a church, it's good to be uh, direct on certain topics. Um, but for this TikTok purposes, I think it's good to um, think and live this type of way and view other brothers and sisters in Christ, because we tend to look at people like they're enemies for some reason, even though they might be a brother and sister in Christ. But the, 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 the quote is an essentials, Uh, And essentials, unity and non-essentials, liberty, but in everything, agape, we forget agape so much. Um, And so we need to we need to bring that back. So in first Corinthians chapter one, verse 10, it says, now I plead with you, brethren. Now, if you take note of Paul is using the word brethren. Now, we just went through the book of Philemon like an hour ago. And Paul kept using brethren, brother, 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 bringing the whole family thing to to, to mind. So the same thing is true here in 1 Corinthians. Paul uses the word brother or brethren at least 28 times. Now, it depends. He might use brother, you know, and it might be more than 28 times, but brethren specifically 28 times. And that's interesting. So that is a theme you don't just keep talking, saying brethren, brethren, uh, brethren, unless, like you don't do that unless you're trying to get your point across. So pay attention to the words. If you see words r- arise often, then take note of it and pay attention to it and write it down and track it down and see how many times he uses it. And then be like, oh, OK, that's really interesting. Um, if you were going to write a letter, you're going to talk about what you want to talk about. And the thing that you want to talk about the most is the most important and it's going to be brought up the most. And so for Paul's case, it's Jesus. It's always Jesus. Okay. Thank you, Carlos. But in first Corinthians chapter one, verse 10, it says, now I plead with you brethren by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, 
but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So here's this household, this Chloe's household. I don't know anything about Chloe um, other than she was in Smallville. If you guys ever watched that, that Superman thing, I think there was a Chloe somewhere in that one. But um, I don't know Chloe's household. I have no information on her. So there's that's a, a big unknown. Don't, not really sure. But it says, for it has been declared to me concerning you, my brother, and that those of the uh, those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. In verse 12, it says, um, now I say this, that each of you... Um, that each, each, well, I get, okay, so before we move on, um, isn't it, okay, so when you think about, um, I suppose, let's say there's people in here who have been here for a long time, I suppose, but you guys have probably disagreed with me at some point, right? And so if you have disagreed with me on some point, you either look at me differently, you either look at me the same. And you're like, I, I, you know, I, you know, I know you're a brother in Christ and I just disagree with you on that topic over there, but you know, everything else you say, I'm, I'm online. I'm, I'm, I, I agree with, or like, I agree with 75% of the things that you're talking about. There's a level where you kind of line up with other people, right? So, but brothers and sisters in Christ, assuming that you have everybody solid, as far as the gospel is concerned, what is interesting is that then all, all of a sudden all these secondary topics arise. And so then you have these things over here like alcohol, women preachers, speaking in tongues, these spiritual gifts, um, the post-trib, pre-trib, mid-trib, all of these secondary types of things, right? And there's all kinds of huge divisions about, among these things. And so people see things differently. But when you understand that if they believe in Christ and they are... They, they believe that the only way to heaven is by accepting Christ as their personal savior, believing that he, Jesus is the son of God, that he led a sinless life, that he died on the cross for your sins. And then he rose again on the third day. If they believe that, do you just, do you like, like, it's not on me to like say who's saved and who's not saved, but it's interesting. It's just so interesting how we are because we look at other people and we're like, oh, they're wrong. Right. And we we're like, they're, they're doing it. They're, they're doing it completely wrong and they're sinning. Right. And then we just, and so I, there's a time for that, right? The Bible says, do not judge, but then it also says judge and righteous judgment. And it's so difficult. And so what I want you to understand is that if you are a student of the Bible, when you see another brother or sister doing something that you disagree with, love needs to be going forth first, go there with nothing but love, like hat in your hand type of mentality and then approach them with the most love that you can possibly show somebody because they are a brother. They are a sister. And it's so funny how we are because we do the opposite. Like <laughs> I, I told you guys, I was in that one. What's his name? Uh, John, uh, John from Patmos. I joined his live and he's, he talks about end times all the time. And I just made the comment. I was like, pre-trib seems to make the most sense with me. And I did a smiley face and that's all I said. And then I got blocked. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll see myself out. Um, but it was just the funniest thing. I was like, what was that? I was like, I, I'm, I feel like he was pretty solid on the things like the way he was looking at. And it's just very interesting that I got blocked, but I thought it was interesting. Um, and I don't know, you know, it's not that big of a deal, but I just thought it was hilarious. But thinking about brothers and sisters in Christ, if we disagree on some secondary issues, like for example, alcohol, alcohol is a big deal. People are struggling. Some people say it is. Some people say it's right, wrong. Some people say it's right. Some people say it's all this type of stuff. And we've talked a lot about alcohol within these studies, but it's just funny how the people who are for sure, they're like, I am positive that it's wrong. They look at people differently and they almost like they almost forget. And it, it, it's just, we just need to be mindful. We need to remember love. And so is it a primary issue? No. Okay. Well then we can, we can address this and we can still have, I don't know. It's just an interesting thing. Right. So I don't know, be sensitive to it. It's tough. We're all trying to do, I don't know. It's tough guys, man. The more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. And that is just, that's kind of what you're, you're just seeing now. I'm just talking now. Okay. Anyways, but the question on the table, after all that, the question on the table is, do we grieve him when we attack another brother? 
if I attack another brother, if I attack another Chris, uh, another Christian, another another sister, am I grieving? Am I grieving him? Right? Because if I'm in Christ and they are in Christ and we are of the same body, then am I grieving him? Right? That's an interesting thing. And so like, I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't want to grieve him. So if we're all in the same body, it'd be like, like, you know, we all have a, a role, like all of these fingers, they all have a different role. And so like, if I'm ticked off at this finger, because I don't agree with it, what it's doing. And I just, ha, ah, you know, like, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm not going to do that because it's the same body. And so it's just an interesting thing, how we are. Anyways, first Corinthians chapter one, verse 12. Sorry, I did not mean to wax long there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. So this is kind of expounding on what we just got done talking about. So the question on the table is, is in verse 13, is Christ divided? No, he's not. Christ is of the same body. We are of the body of Christ. And so um, baptism is on the, the, the topic of conversation now. Paul says in verse 14, he says, I thank God that I did not baptize, uh, that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. And then he goes to verse 16. He says, yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other because it wasn't that important for Paul to actually think about baptism because of verse 17, he says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. It's so interesting that Paul is, uh, he, 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 he's, he, he was here to preach the gospel. That's what you and I are here to do, right? Baptism is not a salvation issue. There are people who would disagree with me on that, and there's nothing I can do to change their mind. They are stuck in their kind of ways. And so the question on the table is what Galatian brings to the forefront of our minds, because Paul wrote to the Galatia churches. He was talking to the, the Christians within Galatia, and he's like, I'm writing to you because of all these people who are giving you a different gospel. These people, he's like, you're accepting a different gospel. And so the question on the table that you can answer, only you, the person behind the screen, can you tell me what is a different gospel? Or do you think that this is the same gospel as this, even though there's a little difference? If there is a difference in something other than putting your faith in Christ and Christ alone in order for salvation, then any if you add, add to what Christ did on the cross, or if you take away from what Christ did on the cross, then that is a different gospel. And so we need to be mindful of what the gospel is. And that can be found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. But it is Christ died according to the scriptures. He was buried and that he rose again on the, on the third day according to the scriptures. That is everything. And that is what I want you guys to know more about anything. But Paul never, like he, he didn't even know how many people he baptized because it wasn't that big of a deal. He's like, yeah, sure, I baptized um I baptized uh, the household of Stephanus. Besides that, I don't know whether I baptized any other. He's like, no. But he could tell you the people that he led to the Lord <laughs> because that was what it's all about. Verse 17, it says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. So important to understand that. There are people who are like, oh, this is, doesn't apply. This doesn't apply. Well, I'm one of those people who say that Christ is everything. It is Christ plus nothing. There are people who say Christ plus baptism. There are people who say Christ plus uh, obeying the Ten Commandments, Christ plus this and this and this. I say put your faith in Christ and Christ alone. And if you do, then the rest will take care of itself. But that is how you get saved right there. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So that's that's my stance. 
Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse um, 18. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, is <laughs> we get into this very, so we're going to get into this very interesting uh, next couple verses. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. <laughs> Thanks, Flat Earth. Um, I think it was it Monami sent me one of those the other night. And that was like the first time I think I got one of those. Thank you. Um, but this verse is very interesting for the message of cross of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. What? So if somebody is dying, the cross is foolishness to them. But for those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, that is a phrase right there. Wow, the power of God. So here in verse 18, what I want you to understand here is that this verse quite literally divides the world into two people, into two categories. You are either perishing or you are saved. Uh, gee, mommy, so we're only saved by having faith. Yes, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, let's say man should boast. So you are, it tells you right there, and that's in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, if you wanted to go look that up. Gee, mommy. <laughs> so, okay. Um, but in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18, this verse, this verse, um, should get you to see that the whole world is in two categories. You are either perishing or you are saved. So the, the question on the table is, which one are you in? Are you perishing or are you saved? Did you know that there's people walking around right now who are completely dead spiritually? They're, they're, they're zombies of sorts, right? Like if you want to look at them that type of way, they are, they, they, they don't, they're, they're, they're walking around, they're breathing, but spiritually they are dead. And so which one are you? Which one are you? Are you perishing or are you saved? And so the question on the table is, how do you know that you're saved? And so a, a, a litmus test of sorts, according, you know, playing off of verse 18 here in 1 Corinthians 1, 18, is the question on the table is, well, is the cross, is the message of the cross foolishness to you? Because it says that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. So are you in here right now? And do you look at the cross as if it's ridiculous? As if how? Yeah, right. Okay. Okay. Tell me something else. St mythology. It's, it's fake news. Like all kinds of, is that, do you have any of that going on? That's just a litmus test. I can't tell you if you're saved or not. That's between you and the Lord. But this is a type of litmus test on how can you know that you're saved? Well, ask yourself, do I think the cross is foolishness? Um, it's an interesting way to view things. But it says, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's interesting that he says being saved. Now, we talked about the tenses of salvation, right? When you get saved back Whenever you became a Christian, whether it was yesterday, five days ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, there are tenses of salvation. There's past tense, present tense, future tense. Past tense is when you get justified. When you get justified, it means that you are declared righteous. He imputes his righteousness within you. You are declared righteousness. That was past tense. Justif you have been justified. That's past tense. Present tense, meaning right now, as we're talking, you are currently, if you're born again, you are currently being sanctified. Future tense is when we get home with the Lord, separated from the presence of sin. That is when we will be glorified. So past tense, justified, present tense, sanctified, future tense, glorified. So here in verse 18, uh, in the middle of verse 18, it says, but to us who are being saved, I ha you can say, if you're born again, you can say, I have been saved. I am currently being saved and I will be saved. I have been saved. I am being saved and I will be saved. Past tense, present tense, future tense. So here in verse 18, it says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Being saved, sanctification. We are currently being sanctified. Um, Okay, so let's go to verse 19. In verse 19, it says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. 
So you guys want to go to Isaiah chapter 29. Oh, wow. I almost turned right there. Isaiah chapter 29. Um, in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 14, this is where he is quoting from. Paul is quoting Isaiah. Paul quotes Isaiah like a third of the time. It's crazy. He quotes Isaiah all the time. But in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 14, it says, Therefore, behold, I again do a marvelous work among this people, a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. So that's in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 14. But let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19, it says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? This is so interesting. So what's interesting about this whole scene is that in Corinth, there were about 50 different uh, philosophical movements during this time. And each one with their, their favorite philosophers. But what's fascinating about this is that Christians have, like, we need to understand that Christians have no need of philosophy. Like, we, they have, we have no need of philosophy. If you have the word of God, we have no need of philosophy. So if you go to um, Colossians, let's go to Colossians real fast, because we went through Colossians like a couple weeks ago or two weeks ago or something like that. But in Colossians chapter 2, um, we talked about, uh, you know, Colossians was dealing with Gnosticism. Gnosticism was basically the whole idea of mixing mysticism mixed with Jewish traditions, mixed with man-made traditions, mixed with philosophy. And you would put all of those things and you would stir it around and then you, that, that's what you had. That's, agnostic, that's what an agnostic is. But in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, it tells us how to operate around these people who, 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 like who, who, philosophers, because in uh, Colossians chapter two, verse eight, it says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Everything is according to Christ, not according to me, not according to what you read in a different book outside of the Bible. That's why I say, like, if you're going to read any, if you're going to have a Bible study, don't go buy another book, but stay in the Bible and study the Bible. <laughs> like, I'm not saying that, you know, the commentaries are wrong or anything like that. I'm just saying, just be cautious. Um, but what's interesting, going back to first Corinthians chapter one in verse 20, where it says, where is the wide, where is the scribe, where's the disputer of the sage? When you look at the, the people during this time and the philosophical movement, it's fascinating to know that the word philosophy in the Greek, if you go in your blue letter, blue letter Bible and you click on the word philosophy, the word philosophy literally means the love of wisdom. So there are people who love getting all philosophical and all getting all knowledge and stuff like that. And he says, he was quoting Isaiah 29, verse 14. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19, going back to verse 19 here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19, it says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. That's crazy. So this whole, all these people who love wisdom, if it's not in Christ, you have nothing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. You need to first fear the Lord. If you do not fear the Lord, then you have nothing. And it's not me saying it. That's what the Bible says. It's fascinating. So moving on, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, it says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But, underline that word but, because that's, that's a big but. <laughs> it's way too early. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Sheesh! But to those who are called, those who are called, these are both Jews and Greeks. It's it's so interesting thinking about, like, 
Well, let's read, let's read verse 25. Verse 25, it says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weak the weakness of God is stronger than men. So you have this whole you have this whole phrase here in verse 25, which is the most ridiculous thing ever. It says, but the foolishness of God. That doesn't seem like it should ever be said ever, right? Like it seems so out there and it doesn't seem like it should be here, but it's getting the point across. This is an oxymoron. This is like the most ultimate oxymoron ever. The foolishness of God. He's basically saying like, like the God, God at his worst day is still better than anything ever created. Um, because it says in verse 25, it says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weak and the, or, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So no matter what, no matter how you look at it, no matter how wise you want to be, no matter how prudent you want to be, no matter how philosophical you want to be, God is awesome and we are not. But it's interesting when you look at the, you know, the phrase, the foolishness of God and all the things, the foolishness of the cross, um, because in verse 18, it says for the message of the cross is foolishness. That's crazy, right? That no, we would never say that. Like if you're a Christian, you would never say that the cross is foolishness because the cross is everything. The cross is quite literally everything. Everything centers around the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so when you look at what Jesus did, it's almost, it's weird. Everything, everything that we read about is strange. It's weird. And there's no other way to really say it. Everything you read about in the Old Testament and some things in the New Testament are strange. For example, like, oh, well, well, God does things differently than you and I. He does. Th- hey, thank you, Stephanie. He does things differently than how you and I would ever operate. And what I mean by that is re- you guys remember Naaman in the Old Testament. I think I have like an eyelash going on. Help me. Um, but you guys remember in Naaman in, uh, was it second Kings? Like, um, Elijah tells Naaman to go into the water and dip seven times and then he would be healed of leprosy. So he goes under, he's like, I'm not doing this. Like, this is ridiculous. Like you would think the same thing. You're like, what in the world is going on? Thank you, Sherry. Like, what is going on? So Naaman, he, he does it. And then he ends up getting healed. That is crazy. That is ridiculous. Then you also have, do you guys remember what was it? Numbers 21 when, um, um, Moses and, and the Israelites, they were wandering through the wilderness and they started complaining. And then all of these serpents came out of nowhere and they started biting the Israelites and they all started dying. So then they go to Moses and they're like, we've sinned against you. Can you go ask God to help us out here? And so Moses prays, he asks God, and then God tells Moses what to do. And he tells Moses to make a bronze serpent and put it on a staff and lift it up. And anybody who lifted at the serpent, anybody who looked at the serpent would be saved. That is weird, but you can read the entire Old Testament and find out, like, have no idea why God chose that method until you get to John chapter three, verse 14 and 15. And then Jesus himself says, just how Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, so shall the son of man be lifted up. He was talking about the crucifixion. That is weird. It doesn't make any sense. And then after that, you have Jonah being swallowed by a whale, which is a sign. Are you kidding me? That is weird. But the weirdest thing is the cross. It doesn't make any sense. Why would God choose that? That is what he chose to do. But it is the fool- The message of the cross is foolishness to, ch- to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is unreal. But, okay, when you get to verse 26, moving on, verse 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, it says um, he, it, God chooses all that. Like he chooses his methods, whatever he wants to do. He's God and we are not. And so we are just along for the ride. But it says in verse 26, it says, for you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise, according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And so we talked a lot about this when we went through Ephesians chapter one, we spent like three or four hours on just Ephesians chapter one, because it's there are so many topics to cover but we talked about predestination. We talked about elect. We talked about the called. And so, you know, people get lost in all this kind of area. But the, the easiest way to understand this is that God knew the end from the beginning before time was even here. He knew the end from the beginning because before there was time, you and I are in a bubble and we call it time. 
We're affected by time. I'm getting older every second, and so are you. We are currently dying. Even if you're young and you're uh, feeling alive and you're like, I'm living my best life, like we are still dying. Right when you're born, you're dying because we are in time. We like to think of eternity as a lot of time. No, eternity, there is no time. And so that's what's interesting because God is outside of time. And so when he looks inside of time, he sees from the end, to, or the beginning to the end, and that's just how he operates. So the called or the elect or the predestined, the best way to look at it is he just knows everything. He can't learn. So he knows who's going to, who's who the called is. So the question that you and I are trying to figure it out is like, who are the called? Are you called? If you are called, what is your calling? What are you doing with it? it? Like, that's the question that's on the table. Anyways, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, moving on to verse 27. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, it says, But God has chosen the foolish things of the, of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame, to shame the things which are mighty. This is bananas, right? Like, this, this is wild. This is complete bonkers. But when you think about this, for example, verse 27, I'll read it again. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. So, he does the opposite of what you and I would do. You and I would not do any of the things that he did, like dying on the cross. There ain't no way, right? Like that doesn't make any sense. God did that. Like Jonah and the whale, we wouldn't do that. God did that. Like Nahum going down, dipping seven times. God did that. It's interesting because if you guys, let's go to Ephesians. Let's go to um, Ephesians chapter two. And so on what we're talking about right now is the foolish things compared so the weak compared to the the mighty um we have in verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 27 um God has chosen the foolish things to put to shame the wise so you have foolish versus the wise and then you have the weak things versus the mighty so God chooses the foolish and the weak and he does not choose the wise or the mighty. And what's interesting, if if the power of God came through wisdom, then then only the intellectual would the, the in, intellectual gifted would be saved. And so it's not through wisdom, it's it's through the cross. And so it's just interesting. So so talking about um in verse 27 um, comparing the foolish things to the wise and then comparing the weak things to the mighty. With that in mind, let's read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Because in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so here's what I'm proposing to you, because in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. That's how it starts out. So you have faith. And then at the end of verse nine, it says not of works, lest any man should boast. So it starts out with faith and it ends with pride. And so it starts with faith and it puts down pride. And it's like pride is not, no, remove the pride. It's through faith. And so it's the opposite of what we would do. We would put pride on top because it's something I would do. Like, look at me. Look at how good I am, guys. Look at how awesome I am. Oh, you're not as good as me. Oh, okay. No, you remove all that is through faith faith alone. And so you, when you think about faith versus pride, it's the opposite. He wants humility, humility because of, of Philippians chapter two talks all about the kenosis. God emptied himself. He, 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 he came in, in the likeness of man, making himself of no reputation. That's what Philippians chapter two is about. But it's interesting that when you think about faith compared to pride, that, and then when you come, when you compare Ephesians two, eight, nine to first Corinthians chapter 27, and you you look at God chosen God chose the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and then God chose the weak things of the world to put to shame the mighty. Because there are people who are muscling their way through life, and they're thinking I'm going to make it because I, how awesome I am, and I am working so hard, and I got like a scale of good works over here, bad works over here, and I hope my good works outweigh my bad works. And I'm really working hard to get to heaven. No, they're missing the point. It is for by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a foolish thing. This is this this is the, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us being saved, it is the power of God. And so you can't see it unless you see it. And it's just one of those things. <laughs> it's fascinating. I just I just find it fascinating. But going back to First Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty-seven, it says, But God chose the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. 
Thank you, Sherry. And it says, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the mighty things. And so when you look at what God, how God operated when he was here on the earth, he chose 12 disciples. 11 of those disciples were, they were fishermen, they were tax collectors, they were peasants. And then one out of the 12 was a, a, a Judean. He was, he was a gentleman. He, he was Judas. So he chose the less, the, the least, right? Like a fisherman. Are you kidding me? You're going to choose a fisherman. You're going to choose a tax collector. Everybody hated that guy. You're going to choose a peasant. Are you kidding me? Why didn't he choose all the noble people in the world? Why? Because the foolish, God chose the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to put to shame the mighty. He chose everybody. He lowered himself so that he, we wouldn't want him. He, he made himself of no reputation, right? Taking the form of a bond servant, coming in the likeness of men. Uh, Isaiah chapter 53 talks about how he, he, he did not come in, in the form of comeliness so that we might desire him. He was not an attractive person. He could have like showed up as a male model. He could have showed up in a Lambo, just like with the loud music blasting, like all this type of stuff, like on the parade. No, he was born in a manger. Are you kidding me? That's how he chose. That is crazy. That is not how we would have done it, but that is how God did it. That's how God chose to do it. And it says in verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that which are mighty. Very fascinating. Moving to verse 28, it says, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Oh, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Man, God chooses strange things to win us. That is for sure. But in verse 30, it says, but of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So here in verse 30, you have righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Righteousness, when you, when you get justified, you are declared what? When you become justified, you are declared what? You are declared righteous. You are declared righteous. Righteous. When you get justified, you are declared righteous. So that's past tense. That's justification. When you when you when you get justified, you are declared righteous. And so when you are currently, as you go about your day to day, what are you what are you being right now? You are presently being sanctified. And so when you get home, we will be glorified. We will be redeemed. Like well, our bodies will be redeemed. So you have the past tense, the present tense, and the future tense here, in a form in verse thirty. But then you get to verse 31 and it says that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. And this is such a call to humility. This is such an amazing call to humility. If you pay, if you've been paying attention at all, you know, Proverbs chapter six, verse 16, the seven things that God hates. The first thing that's on that list is a proud look. Pride. God hates pride. Isaiah chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 28 talks about the talks about Satan and Lucifer, right? Like it talks about it gives you all this stuff. Satan was like the five I wills. He's like, I will be like the most high. I will ascend to heavens. I will, I will, I will, I will. He has so much pride and God hates that. And so when we understand that we need to be less of me and more of him, so I must in, uh, decrease so that he must increase. That's the, that's the mentality that we need to have. And it's about the posture of your heart. And so when you look at verse 31 here and it says that, that, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. It is, that's where we need to glory. It's not, I'm not going to glory in me. I'm not going to glory in you. I don't want you to glory in me. I want you to see me and glory in Christ for let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. That's what it's all about. Like the good works that you and I do as Christians, you should not take any glory in that. You should give all the glory to God. And so that only you can answer that type of stuff. Like, I don't know. And so it's so, we need to be, thank you, Candy. We need to be so incredibly mindful about the danger of pride because pride can sink in and, and creep in there and kind of like lay an egg and nest in there and have another egg. And next thing you know, they all hatch. And next thing you know, you get all mindful about how cool you are and you start listening to the things that people are saying about how cool you are. And then that is so dangerous. I don't care. Like, no, give all the glory to God. It's all about Christ. It's not about you. And that's where we need to be. And so that's what verse 31 says. He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. That is what I got for you guys here in first Corinthians chapter one. So that was that was a good study. We did Philemon. I don't know if you guys were here for that, but it is um, 
the Philemon was a good study. We knocked that out earlier. And then now that's that's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So, yeah, not bad. Um, sorry for being late today. Um, it is, uh, it, I, I meant to, I wanted to be on around 1245 AM. And uh, that is, <laughs> I, I, I was, uh, I was, I was delayed and I apologize about that. But I post all of these up on YouTube. If you guys, there's a YouTube up in my TikTok profile. If you guys go there, um, there's a YouTube link. If you wanted to follow me over there on YouTube, that would be cool. Go subscribe over there because I don't have any of social media. So if they ban TikTok, TikTok for whatever reasons, then maybe we can stay in touch and we can continue on uh, these Bible studies on YouTube. I, I, I don't know how to do it over there yet, but I could learn if the time comes. But I upload all of these videos onto youtube so if you want to go watch them they're all up there we've done revelation daniel ruth um john uh hebrews james romans acts you know we're doing first corinthians now we've done galatians ephesians philippians colossians first and second thessalonians first and second timothy we've done titus philemon and now we're diving into first uh, first of corinthians so this is a good one um jackie thanks for being here the whole time yeah for sure um Yes, flowers, for sure. Would you know him if he walked up to you right now? Would you know him? Hmm. God is good. Thanks for being here, guys. I really appreciate it. It's the one thing I want you to understand more than anything else. You know, we go through these studies and I give you my take on things. And I want you to be mindful of what the Bible says about this type of stuff. The Bible tells you to... Search the scriptures daily. In Acts chapter 17, the, stu- the, the challenge on the table is to receive the word with all readiness. Acts chapter 7 says, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things are so. You need to do that. Hear what I say. Hear it. Take it as a grain of salt and then search it and find it out for yourself. Don't just listen to me. Like, I, I'm never going to lead you astray on purpose, but I am gonna. I could be wrong on some of the things I think, but I'm not wrong on the gospel. And that is what you need to know. Um, thanks, Mark. Yes. What Mark just pinned there is my uh, YouTube. So if you t- it's, if you type that in, it'll pop up. It's, it stands for TikTok replays on YouTube. YouTube. So I, I chose the worst name ever. I don't know. I'm new here. <laughs> I need an adult. <laughs> um, thanks, Ryan. I took notes. We'll read that when I'm off. Very cool. Um, Jules. Yeah. Thanks for being here. I'm glad, glad this worked out. Matthew 18. What's up, Sydney? How are you? Oh man. What's his YouTube name? Oh yeah. Thank you, Deb. Um, find numbers 19 numbers 19 the red heifer that was great yeah cool blondie thanks for being here you know it's really challenging studying all this sorry i was late ryan but i enjoyed the parts of the study i did here no problem dj nick no problem at all i'm glad you were i I didn't put out a tiktok story and letting everybody know that i would be here so that was my fault just because i i didn't pull one out because i didn't know um I didn't know um, what time. And so I, I initially put out a TikTok story saying I would be live around 1245. But then I figured I, I, I couldn't because I had to do some stuff. And uh, so that's why I was late to the party. But we got her done. Thank you. Yeah, Laura. For Yeah, for sure. I'm glad you guys keep coming back. Very cool. Very cool. What's up, Ellie? How are you? I'm blessed. Uh, Holy Spirit, let me hear. Thanks for being the hands and the feet. I see that in your 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 uh, your profile. Hands and feet. What is that? Um, reminds me of casting crowns. And if we are the body, why aren't his hands reaching? Why aren't his feet walking? Um, why aren't his words teaching? I, I would know if I actually sang it, but you don't want to hear that. So, <laughs> and if we are the body. <laughs> um, but just want to introduce myself quick 30 seconds huh what you talking about um we don't know when it will happen yeah so just in case you guys weren't here for the beginning of this there is actually um so um the the whole situation going on over in israel there's this red heifer situation they found somebody that is uh, has the right qualifications to do the whole sacrifice over in israel right now if you're not aware there's i I put a little screenshot of the temple institute they announced it uh like probably like 12 hours ago now and so it is so important to be mindful of this type of stuff because there is going to be 
a sacrifice of the red heifer. They are going to do that. There's going to be a third temple that is going to be physically built. There are people who, who, who disagree that a physical temple is going to be built and they say that it's our bodies are the temple. That's incorrect. There's going to be a physical temple going to be built. And we know that because in Revelation chapter 11, it talks about these two witnesses that are going to be here during the tribulation. A lot of people think that it's going to be Moses and Elijah just because of all the signs and wonders that they do. Um, but they're going to be in front of the temple for three and a half years, teaching and preaching in front of the temple. And so we know that there's going to be a temple because there's going to be two witnesses preaching in front of it. And so therefore it does not apply to you and I, because you and I will be in the, in heaven with Jesus. And I cannot, I cannot wait. I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, which means the rapture will occur the very next thing. And you guys need to be mindful of what's going on over in Israel right now. Well, before, um, before we talk about that, which we already talked about this, this is just reiterating everything. Um, this person, the Kohan, I think is how you pronounce it. He is of the tribe of Levi. He, he's an Aaronic priesthood. They, they trace his lineage back. He's, he was never around anything dead. He, he meets all these qualifications. And so if he agrees to take part in the sacrifice, then they're going to train him up very, very seriously. And it's fascinating. It is fascinating. I need you guys to understand how serious this is. This is a massive, 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 massive deal because you're quite possibly seeing prophecy being unfold, unfold right in front of our eyes. And so you need to also be mindful that when the whole Russia and Ukraine war began, the um, um, Russians removed a lot of their military troops from Syria to redirect them into Ukraine to battle over there. But what they've been doing now is they've been putting them back into Syria. And so a theory, and this is just a theory, this is just projecting, because we know there, there's going to be an Ezekiel 38, 39 war happening in the future. We don't know when it's going to happen. A lot of people project that it's going to happen after the rapture, but before the tribulation. So that's just a guess, but nobody really knows. Um, but what's interesting right now is that Russia is, they have their troops in Syria looking into Israel. And that's fascinating. That is fascinating. They're looking, they can see over into it. And so my point here is to get you to understand that Ezekiel 38 and 39, you have these key players that are on the table, which are Russia, Turkey, and Iran. And all of them are right there in Syria. Israel just took out this Iranian general. They, they eliminated him. And so obviously there's going to be some backlash on that. And so the, 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 the thought that is on the table just to kind of roll around in your mind as a type of scenario is to think what if Israel does that kind of an attack again here in the future and accidentally takes out a Russian military personnel, what is going to be the response from Russia? Because Russia is not yet active within the Israeli conflict, right? They're not yet there. They're, they're kind of being in the area. They're in the area. They're very well in the area. But what happens if accidentally a Russian soldier or personnel is removed by one of their attacks, right? What then? What's going to be the response by Russia? Because then Russia is going to get involved. It is unbelievable. It is a complete powder keg that's going on over there. And you guys just need to be aware about this kind of stuff. And I'm only, I'm not telling you this to scare you. I'm not, because I believe that the rapture is going to occur before the tribulation begins. I don't think we're ever going to know who the Antichrist is unless you're left behind because the Antichrist isn't going to be revealed until the restrainer is removed. That's what second Thessalonians talks about. But I need you to understand the times that we're living in for the sole purpose so that I can stir you up. Hebrews chapter 10 talks about stirring people up and we need to stir one another up even more as we see the day approaching. The whole point as brothers and sisters in Christ, if you're born again, is to stir one another up. So the question on the table is, what are you doing for the Lord? Are you, if you're saved, amen, let's go. Awesome. Woo. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? When was the last time you told somebody about Jesus? J Jules told me that she bought some tracks. She's going to try to hand them out. I'm like, let's go, Jules. High five. Um, but it's it's so important to understand because, you know, the Bible paints a very clear picture that we are all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. If you're born again, if you are a Christian, you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10. We will stand before the Christ, the judgment seat, the bema seat of Christ. And it says that all of our thing, all of our works, whether good or bad, will be there. And then it's going to be consumed by fire. And only the gold, silver, and precious stones are going to remain. 
So all your stuff, everything you've ever done is going to be right before you. And we're going to be looking at it and be like, oh boy. <laughs> so the Bible gives us this picture that we, so we need to continue on and, and endure and persevere so that we may not be ashamed. Are you going to be ashamed at his coming? And so it's just going to be one of those questions like, you know, and so I'm trying to stir you up because there's still time. Like if you know that there's going to be a final exam here in like two weeks, you have time to prepare. And so that's all I'm trying to do is just to stir you up and, you know, get ready. You're, you don't earn your salvation. If salvation is for by grace, are you saved through faith? And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's through faith and faith alone. But after you accept Christ, then works are evident. They just happen naturally. So what? So are you living that way? So that's, that's the thought on the table. Um, yes, I agree. Very cool, Sharon. Um, amen. Yeah, Ellie and Sandy. Very cool. Oh, man. Conspiracy theory. They will put passage of cargo ships there um yeah i mean hey hey there i want to talk to um give him the glory always that's right mateo oh man iron sharpens iron as well yes i'm more excited than scared me too nay nay like it's like a it's like a mixture of like excitedness like i can't believe this is happening like are you kidding me do you guys know how cool it is to be alive during this time it is unbelievable it is unbelievable and it makes me want to go redo revelation just because i feel like we're living it but me you know ezekiel would be kind of fun too just because of ezekiel 38 39 but it, we would have to do the whole book and then you guys, so it's funny because there, um, people were wanting me to do Isaiah and, um, I actually was starting to dive into it today. And then I was just like, nope. <laughs> so I, it is just so intimidating. It is so intimidating for me. I don't know why it is. We'll get there eventually. I just am going to need some time to prepare for that because I got to get my mind wrapped around it. It was just so funny for me to look at. Yeah, I thought of you, Jules, because I know you want to go through Isaiah. But I, I quite literally, I was like, okay, here we go. And I was like, nope, not right now. It's not, it's, it's not, um, it's not time yet. Oh, yeah. Okay. So uh, that's my uh, YouTube. If you guys wanted to go look it up, TT replays on YT. So TikTok replays on YouTube. And there's a YouTube link up in my TikTok profile. If you guys wanted to go subscribe over there, because I don't have any other social media. So if I get banned on here, then we'll at least be able to hang out still on YouTube or if they ban YouTube. Um, um, yeah, so that's, okay, Zephaniah. Oh, Zephaniah. I mean, they're all good. You know, I just, it's just really intimidating because it's 66 uh, chapters. I mean, that's so much time and that's so much energy and it takes a lot. Like it, it, it takes me, like there's times like where it takes me like six hours to go through to get ready for this. So when we go through a four hour live session, like it's, it, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes, but um yeah. Did you want to come up, Christian? Yeah, you can you can come up for a, a minute. I'll, I'll let you come on up. What's up, buddy? Hey, what's going on, man? Man, so like I said, I just want a quick 30-second introduction. I'm not trying to do anything, but literally my last name is Christensen. The religion, S-E-N. Spelled 12, 12 letters. You can find Christ, Christian, Saint, Sinner. That's why I miraculously came up with Christian Sinner. It is what it is. I mean, blasphemy, whatever, whatever, whatever. But uh, it's 12 letters. How many disciples did Jesus have? 12. He, he made 13, though. But uh, my initials are ESC. If you got a keyboard in front of you, I'm on every keyboard in the world with my own personal button, Escape. Hmm. I'm I'm here to talk. Uh, I got I got a Bible verse that I like to. I only do verse 19s, and I randomly open up a 19. Do you know the uh, phenomenon going on in the world today? What's that? Gold and silver. All right. Yeah. Yeah. No. I. I yeah. I know. It's good to. It's good to have those things if you, if you have the uh, the option to. I agree with that. Because it. It has a, it will never lose value because it's a precious metal. You did like I, uh, Jeremiah 52, 19. Can I read it? Uh, yeah, sure. 
All right. So remember, I only do 19s. I randomly open up the Bible and I, I do verse number 19. So let's let's enjoy this one. It's pretty nifty. Uh, and the basins and the fire pans and the bowls and the cauldrons and the candlesticks and the spoons and the cups, that which was gold and gold and that which was silver and silver took the captain of the guard away. Isn't that cool? Like he was getting like literally robbed or something. Yeah. Yeah, man. That That is, that is cool. Um, what's your name? My name is Eric Christensen. Eric, Eric. All right, cool. Cool, man. Well, um, I appreciate you coming up. Um, um, if you feel if you feel like continuing talking, you can shoot me a message here on TikTok. <laughs> my, my messages are open for anybody and ever everybody. So um, that is uh, that is definitely an option for you. But I appreciate you coming up, man. Hell yeah. Or heck yeah, brother. <laughs> <laughs> OK. All right. See you, buddy. Thank you, man. Yep. So, um, So yeah, I just I just wanted to uh, just stir you guys up. Hopefully, um, <laughs> um, stir you guys up. Stir you guys up. Uh, that verse, if you guys were interested, is is found in Hebrews chapter ten, and I'll read it again just because I think it's so so important to our day. In uh, Hebrews chapter ten, verse. 24 Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 is 24 Hebrews 10 24 it says and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some but exhorting exhorting means to encourage but encouraging one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching and I feel personally it's my own personal opinion I believe we are seeing the day approach I see it's approaching right now and it is super close and it's so interesting. And so just be mindful of this. There are people who say, oh, people have been saying it's the end of the world for centuries. And they're right. They have been saying that. But the difference is, is that it was never applicable back during their time because of what Revelation 13 implies. In Revelation chapter 13, it talks about how there's going to be two beasts. You have the, the beast and the, the false prophet. And it says that no one will be able to buy, uh, buy or sell unless they have the mark of the beast. Now, that power is going to be given to the Antichrist. But the thing that you need to understand here is that that was never applicable ever. It's never been applicable before. There's never been a way to control anybody, whether they buy or sell, unless they had the mark of the beast. Like, go, go back 40 years ago. It was not applicable. You couldn't have done it. But now you can because of all the technology. It's unbelievable. And so now... Things apply in our world that didn't used to apply. Back in 1948, when Israel became a nation, that was massive. That was massive. And so then you fast forward from 1948 to 2024, and here we are today. We have so many things happening. We're four months into 2024, and it just feels like we're in, like, what is happening right now? It is crazy. So that's just some, something to consider. Now it is possible to control whether you buy or sell because you have your money in the bank. Most people have their money in the bank. It's just ones and zeros, ones and zeros, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, 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 like ones and zero. It's digital. And so uh, we, we're living in this digital type of world. And so when you understand the, the implications of everything that is mentioned in Revelation, the book of Revelation, which is completely eschatological, it's prophetical, it is good to know these things so that you can kind of kind of gauge which way you're leaning as far as like where we're le where, where we are in the prophetic timeline and so yeah that's why i believe in a pre-tribulation rapture um and there's all kinds of reasons i love talking about it and it just you know i just it's, it's just, it just seems so important to talk about in our day today but we've already done that study so i don't want to do it again i do want to do it again but I, we're not going to do it again yet um binary yeah candy cbdc is absolutely la um 
why are you in the car all the time, bro? Um, how do you know I'm in the car all the time? You don't even follow me. What's your name? Yo, you Reich. Ch <laughs> Um, just because I can be really loud in here. All glory to God. Got to go. Um, thank you, G Mommy, for being here. I appreciate it. Um, some people are saying Christ has already returned. It's all done. That is completely wrong, Jules. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. That is completely wrong. It scares me if we do go through the tribulation. Well, um, it's not going to change. This is why you need to understand what you believe. Know what you believe now. Um, build yourself up. And... Um, you know, the people in Thessalonica, they thought that they were going through it. And so that's why they were, hey, thank you, Chris. Um, they thought that they were going through it. That's why they were freaking out. They stopped working. They're like, you know, the day of the Lord. That's why Paul had to write to them again and encourage them. But um, they are not children of the night. They are children of the day. There's the complete compare and contrast there, night and day type situation. Um, but yes. Please explain why people will, um, please explain why very few will find the narrow path. That's really interesting. I don't know. Um, you know, it's a, it's, it's an interesting verse, but you know, it says men will be lovers of themselves. Uh, we just went through that in, uh, first and second Timothy and or the pastoral epistles. People are so prideful and arrogant and the lie, there's going to be a lie. If you read second Thessalonians, it talks about the strong delusion is going to be sent. And it's just, it's a, it's a type of judgment on the world. It, it's really fascinating thinking about it because right now I want you to imagine you are God. Imagine you are God and you sent your only son to die and you sent him to the world. You see, you're looking down on earth. You see your son die and then he rises again from the dead, but you see what we did to him. And then we, Jesus ascends back up into heaven. And now you're watching the earth and you're watching everything. And not only did you send your son, but now you gave the world your Bible, the word of God. So now the world, the world has all of these witnesses. They have all of these, like, like everything that the apostles did. We have the entire full counsel of God. And here we are in earth, on earth right now. And Christianity is hated. Now, this is nothing new to God. God knows that. He's like, you will have tribulations. They hated me first. They're going to hate you. It's interesting. And it's because this is not our home. The We need to understand who this world belongs to. This is Satan's world. That's why when Jesus was on the earth, Jesus, when he was tempted by the devil, Satan offered him all the kingdoms of the world. Now, you need to understand that Satan had the power to do that. Because if Satan didn't have the power to give those king, kingdoms to Jesus, then it wouldn't have been a temptation. Because Jesus would have known that it wasn't him to get his to give. Those kingdoms of the earth were, they belonged, they belong to Satan. And so we live in this fallen world. And so people are deceived. Hey, thank you, Miracle. People are deceived on a massive level. People who have been going to church for decades are still lost. And it's heartbreaking seeing that the mission field should be within churches. A lot of times you have all these people going to these mega churches, they got their, you know, anything that tickles their ears. And it's fascinating seeing this type of world because people are lost and the hardest people to reach are the people who are lost. The hardest people to reach are the ones who, I'm sorry, the hardest people to reach are the ones who think that they're already good. It's kind of like if you go to bed at night and you go up and you, you know, like you've probably been there, like you go to sleep, you're laying in bed and you're like, did I lock the front door? Did I close the garage door? And so you have all of these thoughts and then you're like, you tell yourself, yeah, no, I locked the door for sure. And then you sleep soundly because you just told yourself that you did those things. But unbeknownst to you, your front door is wide open, your garage door is wide open, all your windows are wide open, but you slept soundly because you had a false sense of security. There is a world that we are living in where most people have a false sense of security. If you go, I just talked to a buddy of mine and I tried witnessing to him and I was like, hey, how do you know for sure you're going to heaven? And he told me he thinks that you just need to be a good person. Dude is like, like uh, 47 years old. And uh, I tried telling him what I could, but he didn't seem to really want to be, talk about it. So I changed the subject because I'm not going to force it on anybody unless they are wanting to hear. 
But my point is, is that that is a lot of people. There's a lot of people who just don't want to hear it. They don't like God. They hate God because how could God, if God is all loving, this, 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 people are very deceived because of all the things going on in TikTok, everybody, you know, all these Christians, Christians give other Christians a bad rap. And some Christians aren't even Christians, but they label them so that, you know, you can go on and on. So um, the very few is, uh, it just is, it's just, just how it is. I don't, I don't know. There's only one good person. Yes. I would believe no matter what. No kidding. Yes. Okay. Um, I used to be a believer, but left the faith. I do miss the common though. Hello, Millie. You missed the common? What do you mean the common? Um, I have a question. So if it turns out there is no pre-trib rapture, would you still believe? Yeah, Bree, I would. Um, I would because um, there. Th this is that's a secondary issue. It's a secondary issue. The the pre-trib. Uh, oh, community. Um, okay, so what did you say? Community. Uh, I forget what you said. I used to be a believer, but left the faith. But oh, do miss the community though. Yeah, well, some communities are not the best, but yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Well, you're welcome here at any time, um, Melly. But yeah, no, I believe in a pre-tribulation pre rapture. I am firm on that belief. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm right. Um, if I go through it, then I'm going to have the mindset of what Peter and all the other apostles did in what, like Acts chapter four or five, because when they when they were persecuted for Jesus' his, sake, how did they leave after they got beat? They walked away rejoicing because they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And that's unbelievable. It's a matter of your perspective. And so they're going to get a crown when they get to heaven because you get a crown for suffering. And so they're going to get that crown. And so if you like we look at suffering as if it's the worst thing ever, but they, the apostles, they viewed it as they were rejoicing because they were found worthy to suffer for his namesake. And we need to remember who we're dealing with here. We are dealing with God Almighty. And it is crazy when you think about that. Like he is everything. He dwells in unapproachable light. Like that's who we're talking about here. That's God who sent his son to die for me. And I'm just like, I am the worst person ever. Did you know that God had to separate himself from Adam and Eve when Eve just took a bite? Does that not show us how serious he takes sin? Because that is not a bad thing in our eyes. Like if I told you, if you came over and you, I'm like, hey, don't take a bite of that apple. And I walk out and I come back in, you took a bite. And I'm like, dude, come on, man. Like it would have been like, a, it would have been a funny joke, but it would have been wrong. God, that they deserve the death penalty because of that. That's how serious God takes that little, little offense. You and I, we have these little white lies that we, we do and these things that aren't that bad. But it's so serious. And so that's what we need to we need to learn how to think. We need to view sin from God's point of view, not from our point of view. And that's the challenge that's on the table. So um, I don't know if that helps answering that question at all. But um, OK, guys, well, um, if I don't, then that's fine, too. All right, guys. Well, again, I, I'm going to I'm going to be getting off here. But if you guys want to, um, there's a YouTube video, uh, YouTube um, uh, link in my TikTok profile. If you guys wanted to su go subscribe over there, that would be really neat because I don't have any other uh, media, social media. And uh, if TikTok gets banned, like how, you know, there's rumors that that could happen. If TikTok gets banned, then we could talk over there and set something up over there. I post all of these lives up on YouTube. So they're there for you if you would like to go back and review them. You don't have to. It's not a big deal. Um, but it's there as a tool if you would like to. Um, I don't know when I'm going to, oh, live. Um, we'll probably go live on, what is today? Today is Thursday. Um, I think Friday. It went, yeah, Friday. I think we'll go live on Friday if you guys would like to. Friday, you guys can plan on Friday probably around midnight, uh, 12.45 a.m. or so. And, uh, yeah, so that's probably the next time. Um, have a blessed day. You guys do, too, and get some good night's sleep. Tell somebody about Jesus, and I will see you guys next time. Um, if you follow me here on TikTok, um, that would be cool. Um, you don't have to, um, I do put out a little TikTok story, letting everybody know when I go live. Um, so I try to give you guys like a couple hours notification whenever I do go live, I say, Hey, I'm going live in five hours. Um, just in case you would like to prepare, but, um, just the next date is probably going to be on Friday. We can cover a couple chapters more in first Corinthians. 
And uh, if you guys have any questions about anything ever, feel free to message me. Um, I would love to talk to you. If you have any questions about salvation or, hey, what does this verse mean? What does this passage mean? Hey, what do you mean about what does this mean? Or can you pray for me or anything like that? Like, feel free to message me. You don't have to follow me here on TikTok. I don't really care about followers. I'm just saying if you follow, then you can get those alerts. You don't have to follow me if you want to message me. So um, if you ever feel like reaching out, I would love to talk to you and you can use me as a resource. But um, if not, that's completely fine. And I will see you guys hopefully on Friday. And uh, unless the rapture happens, and if that's the case, then that'll be pretty neat. If that's the case, I will see you here, see you there, or I will see you in the air. All right, guys, you guys have a good night.